The Road to Freedom Alama Mashriki's historic journey from Amritsar to Lahore is a documentary that presents the perspective of Alama Mashriki, the founder of the Kaksar movement, on the freedom movement and the partition of India, among other aspects. <laughs> This film entitled The Road to Freedom, Alama Mashriki's historic journey from Amritsar to Lahore, not only provides information about Alama Mashriki, but also uncovers the extraordinary role of Mashriki and the Kaksars in shaping the liberation of the Indian subcontinent, which is now Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. The documentary presents data from Mashriki's family and the Kaksars, both actively involved in the freedom movement. With undisclosed documents, the film sheds light on the subcontinent's 1947 power transfer and freedom struggle, offering revelations that challenge our perception of history. It aims to foster peace between Muslims and Hindus, emphasizing the essence of true leadership. Dedicated to Alama Mashriki, his family, and the Kaksars, who bravely risked their lives to free the Indian subcontinent from British rule. For almost 200 long years, India endured brutal British rule. In the annals of history, there are individuals who emerge as formidable catalysts of change, unyielding in their pursuit of justice and freedom. One such figure was Alama Mashriki, a visionary leader during the struggle for independence in British-occupied India. His profound impact on history stemmed from unwavering conviction. Mashriki once stated, I placed weapons on the shoulders of millions against the British rule, at that time, no one had the courage to raise even a finger against them. Despite facing arrest, imprisonment, detention, and movement restrictions, Mashriki's indomitable spirit never wavered in his pursuit of justice and freedom. As a visionary, he inspired countless souls to resist and revolutionize against colonial oppression. Today, we honor Mashriki's memory, recognizing his sacrifices and enduring legacy as a freedom fighter. His beliefs remain a beacon of hope, reminding us of the transformative power of conviction and courage in standing against oppression, waiting to be uncovered in this gripping documentary. Alama Mashriki was born in Amritsar on August 25, 1888, and died in Lahore on August 27, 1963. He obtained his education in Amritsar, Lahore, and Cambridge in England. He came from a family with a lineage of ancestors and relatives who held important positions in the Mughal and Sikh empires. His father, Khan Atta Muhammad Khan, was a prominent figure in British India. Apart from owning rural and urban properties, he also owned the famous Urdu newspaper Vakil in Amritsar and was recognized for his contributions to literature and fundraising for the Hejaz Railway of the Ottoman Empire. He received a prestigious medal from the Turkish Sultan Abdul Hamid II of the said empire. Alama Mashriki's relatives were famous personalities. For instance, his son-in-law, Dr. Akhtar Hamid Khan, a Nobel Prize nominee, founded the Pakistan Academy for Rural Development, which later came to be known as the Bangladesh Academy for Rural Development, as well as the Orangi Pilot Project, both world-renowned projects. His sister Khadija Begum was married to the Prime Minister of Bahawalpur, Khan Bahadur Nabi Buksh. Additionally, his sister Aisha Begum's brother-in-law was the governor of Sindh, Sir Ghulam Hussein Hidayatullah. Several villages were named after Alama Mashriki's relatives, including Bayazidpur and Hamidpur in the district of Gurdaspur in India, and Sharifabad in district Nawabshah in Pakistan. Shafiabad Railway Station, also in District Nawabsha, was named after one of his relatives. Alama Mashriki excelled in academics right from his childhood. He attended government high school and then church mission college, both in Amritsar. Mashriki later enrolled at Foreman Christian College in Lahore for his bachelor's degree. Remarkably, at the age of 18, 
he topped in the master's degree examination in mathematics at the University of Punjab. From 1907 to 1912, Mashriki achieved four triposes at the University of Cambridge in an unprecedentedly short time, breaking all previous records in the history of the university. The university and the British newspapers showered praises on Mashriki. With these exceptional accomplishments, Mashriki emerged as a world-famous mathematician and scholar, widely acclaimed as one of the greatest minds the world has ever produced. He received prestigious honors and even earned a Nobel Prize nomination in literature for his book entitled Tazkira. Around the mid-1920s, Mashriki was inducted as a fellow of several prestigious societies in Europe, which only accommodated highly acclaimed personalities. Former Pakistani ambassador Mohammad Ibrahim Qureshi described him as a super genius, awestruck by his vast knowledge. Conversations with Mashriki were humbling and spellbinding. Qureshi vividly recalled his discussions with Mashriki, saying, I discussed several subjects with him, and he spoke to me in detail. I soon realized that he was an ocean of knowledge. When conversing with him about scholarly topics, he leaves one spellbound. <laughs> Alama Mashriki, a globally respected figure, associated either face-to-face -face or via correspondence with world elites, including kings, heads of state, and renowned personalities. In 1926, Mashriki embarked on a visit to Europe. In Egypt, he delivered a compelling speech at the International Caliphate Conference, opposing the British-sponsored caliph's appointment and presenting proposals to revive Muslim glory. His speech was widely acclaimed, published by an Egyptian publisher, and distributed internationally. Opposing British agendas under the watchful eyes of British intelligence agencies was seen as daring and impressive by his fellow countrymen. During his stay, he also delivered lectures on his book entitled Tazkira at different forums, including al Azhar University. The scholars of the said institution honored him by bestowing upon him the title of Alama Mashriki, which means the Sage of the East. In Germany, Mashriki was warmly acclaimed by President Hindenburg's niece, Helene Nostitz, who introduced him to famous professors, paving the way for his intellectual achievements. During his stay, Adolf Hitler met Mashriki at the Berlin State Library, courtesy of Professor Gotthold Weil's introduction. Hitler discussed Mashriki's published work, Tazkira. However, their differing views on humanity's oneness led to no alignment, as Mashriki upheld this principle while Hitler opposed it. Invited by Albert Einstein, Mashriki had a meeting with the scientist and his wife, Elsa Einstein, at their home. During this meeting, Mashriki's brilliance shone through leaving a lasting impression on both Einstein and his wife. Throughout his time in Germany, Mashriki delivered captivating speeches to audiences, which were covered by the media. Further details were available in Al-Isla Weekly Journal of May 31, 1935. After traveling in Europe, Mashriki returned to India. In Europe, Mashriki saw a high living standard, higher quality of food, and improved infrastructure. On the other hand, Mashriki also saw the miserable conditions of the masses under British rule. He said, People ask me that I traveled the East for years. What have I seen? How shall I tell what I have seen? From this end to that end I saw towns in ruins, broken and shaken bridges, dirt-clogged canals, dusty streets, abandoned highways. I saw wrinkled faces, undernourished bodies, stooping backs, empty brains, insensitive hearts, inverted logic, aberrant reason. I saw oppression, slavery, poverty, pomp and vanity, detestable vices, clusters of disease, burnt forests, cold ovens, barren tilths, dirty attire and useless hands and feet. I saw brothers who were foes to one another. I saw days without purpose and I saw nights which lead to no dawns. Will Durant, an American historian, wrote in his book The Case for India, I went to India, one-fifth of the human race suffering poverty and oppression bitterer than any to be found elsewhere on the earth. I was horrified. I had not thought it possible that any government could allow its subjects to sink to such misery. 
and the more I read, the more I was filled with astonishment and indignation at the apparently conscious and deliberate bleeding of India by England throughout a hundred and fifty years. I began to feel that I had come upon the greatest crime in all history. William Digby, a British writer, mentioned in his book, Prosperous British India, a revelation from official records. Time was not more distant than a century and a half ago, when Bengal was much more wealthy than was Britain. How is it now? Thus, there are many, many more rich men in the little of England comprised between Liverpool and Barrow on the west coast and Hull and Newcastle on Tyne on the east coast than there are in the whole of the British provinces of India. The Viceroy of India's Delhi estate had 300-plus rooms, 1.55 miles of corridors, and 190 acres of gardens. The British rulers used Indian resources for grand events. The rulers exploited India's resources, forcing Indians into menial tasks like polishing boots, giving baths, massaging bodies, shaving faces, and cleaning earwax. Indians lived in servant quarters while British rulers lived in grand mansions. Indians were excluded from British-only clubs and locations and needed permits like Kursi Nashin to sit in British officers' offices. The British created loyalists within various fields in India to protect their rule, and rewarded those who supported their government with titles and rewards. Muslim and Indian leaders were not allowed to have their photograph taken with the rulers or enter the Viceroy's Lodge unless they agreed to serve British interests. With such exploitation and oppressive rule, Mashriki turned against the British Raj and decided to topple it. In 1912, Mashriki addressing the Indian Society of the Cambridge University said, our educational achievements bear testimony to the fact that India can produce unparalleled brains that can defeat the British minds. India is capable of producing superior brains that can make the nation's future brighter. After we return from here, we must ponder how to break the chains of slavery from the British. We should keep our vision high and enlarge our aims and goals so we can be free from the chains of slavery as soon as possible. Mashriki later stated, it was not possible to get the Englishmen out of India until this nation of 350 million becomes in every respect better than the Englishmen. Thus, Mashriki founded the Kaksar movement to free the Indian subcontinent. His children, as well as male and female Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs, joined the movement and received military training. Mashriki was the first leader to empower women by training them as soldiers. An all-India Kaksar camp in 1937 saw the participation of uniformed women volunteers, including Mashriki's daughter. Similar to male Kaksars, these women also marched in military style. Jawaid Ahmed Gamidi a famous educationist, said, The Kaksars used to march in a special style, characterized by military-like discipline. In the Kaksar movement, Alama Mashriki presented a picture of how true Muslims should be. Mashriki introduced a level of sincerity, training, discipline, and loyal followers that was unprecedented and highly extraordinary. Mashriki's launch of Al-Isla Journal in 1934 spurred the Kaksar movement's growth, with many newspapers adopting its ideology. The movement quickly spread to countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Bahrain, Burma, Ceylon, Egypt, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Yemen, and parts of Europe. The Times of India reported on August 8, 1938, that Al-Islah gave a fresh impetus to the Kaksar movement, which spread to other regions. To set an example as leader of the Kaksar movement, Mashriki abandoned luxury dressed humbly, and used public transport. On Mashriki's simplicity, Jawayed Ahmed Gamidi, a Pakistani educationist, said, he used to travel in buses. Mashriki and the Kaksars also wore an Akuwat badge on their shoulders, symbolizing equality and unity among all people. Mashriki chose the spade as the party's emblem, representing strength. He stated, we have spade as our symbol. Spade is another sign of humility, and our carrying it on our shoulders shows that we are out to proclaim to the world the dignity of labor. Spade levels up the ground. We are here to level up all society.
Gamidi also described the strict discipline of the Khaksar movement in these words. If, on any occasion, anyone broke discipline, for example, by not arriving on time, punishment was to be given. Mashriki himself would not be an exception and would present himself for punishment as well. By the end of the 1930s, the Khaksar movement had become a powerful force, with millions of people, including notable figures such as Nawabs and members of the Legislative Assembly, joining it. It had thousands of branches in the Indian subcontinent and had spread to many other countries. Giving an example from Rawalpindi of the movement's power, Khaksar veteran named Sher Zaman said, Here in Rawalpindi, a one-day meeting was held and it was attended by people from various walks of life. Even the influential members of society joined the Kaksar movement. There were one million people at the gathering. Men and women who were unable to attend the meeting were watching from rooftops. Gamidi also stated, you cannot imagine the level of his Kaksar's movement, its influence, and the effect it has had. Mashriki organized a large number of people and led them in marches on the streets. If individuals like him can be found in a state, imagine the asset they would be to the state. Mashriki established a mammoth organization through self-help, without relying on a formal academy, and merely on open grounds and fields. He shunned foreign support and financial aid to prevent the substitution of one master for another. His legacy exemplifies the strength of self-help, determination, and independence. Through the Kaksar Tariq, Mashriki promoted unity and service to humanity, regardless of religion and color. He outlined his ideas in a 14-point decree that included, We consider Muslims, nay the whole mankind, to be equal and respect them equally, irrespective of caste, creed, color, and community. Our motto is social service to all, at all times, so as by sacrificing ourselves we provide comfort to others. जैसे मैंने अर्ज किया ना जी कि जब मैंने होज संभाली तो उस वक्त खाकसार मूवमेंट बड़ी थी Masood Mufti, senior bureaucrat and writer, said, When I was growing up, the movement was huge at that time, and they were engaged in community service for people. They tried to instill mystical spiritual values based on true Muslims, placing the Muslim at a very high level in terms of character. So, Muslim has taken a very bland place in the country. About the Kaksars, Gamidi remarked, they had an extraordinary zeal to serve people. If the drain around your house was clogged, they opened it and removed the garbage. They were people with a zeal to serve. He created followers who were willing to sacrifice and give away everything. Mashriki aimed to end British rule in India by 1940 and announced this in Al Islah Journal in January 1939. He proclaimed the holding of a central Kaksar camp for all of India, where 300,000 Kaksars and supporters from different religions would gather to achieve the movement's goal. Mashriki made subsequent important announcements about the plan in his weekly newspaper, Al Islah. In late 1939, due to the failure of the UP government to end the ongoing riots between Sunnis and Shias, in which thousands had been killed and the government was completely unable to bring peace, Mashriki paralyzed the UP government and restored peace. As a result, the British governor of UP, Sir Harry Graham Haig, signed an agreement with the Kaksar movement on Mashriki's terms to contain any threat from the said movement. This was an exceptional event in the history of the British Empire, in which an individual had the ability to challenge the government and render it ineffective. This became a reality, as on Mashriki's order, thousands of Kaksars from across the country had reached Lucknow, and the authorities had lost control of the city. <laughs> Punjab, the government, so we brought him to the world. But the government of India, we brought him to the world.
In this interview with the National Archives of Pakistan, Kaksar Sherzaman recalls Mashriki's extraordinary achievements in resolving the Shia-Sunni conflict. He emphasizes that Mashriki's victory was a remarkable triumph that led to the downfall of the UP ministry, making it a significant event in the Indian subcontinent's freedom movement. The impact of Mashriki's victory instilled terror in the central and Punjab governments. Hamare ha Allama Mashriki utte chap ras chap chap ras chap aur bel cha pure Hindustan ko dehla diya. Dehl gayi zameen Hindustan ki ras kumari se lege dara khaybar tak. Aur bade bade notables. Ye tehreek itni azim thi, itni organized thi. Aapko malum hai ye Talpur Bradran jo hai dono bhai jo the, ye khaksa thi. Bade bade log. سندھ میں فرنٹیر میں پنجاب میں ہر جگہ پر اور ایسی زبردست آرگنائزیشن بالکل ملٹری والی ان کے سارے قواعد ملٹری کے ڈاکٹر اسرار احمد a renowned Pakistani Islamic scholar praising the Kaksar movement states the Kaksar movement with Alama Mashriki's rise in our region and their drill command of Chap Rast Chap Rast and its Belcha shook India from Raj Kumari to the Khyber Pass prominent personalities from Sindh the frontier and Punjab including the Talpur brothers were part of the Kaksar movement it was a great and meticulously organized movement, with rules structured like those of a military organization. With this success, Mashriki's was now widely regarded as the most powerful leader in British India, with the public looking to him to overthrow British rule. Galvanized by the powerlessness of the ruling power, as evidenced in Lucknow, and bolstered by the unwavering support of the nation, it became unequivocal that the formidable goal of toppling British sovereignty was firmly within reach. Therefore, Mashriki wasted no time in taking swift action towards his objective. In a bold move, he published an order in the widely read Al-Isla journal in Urdu, which divided India into 14 provinces and appointed Kaksar governors to each of them. These governors were given a clear mandate to add 2.5 million additional Kaksars to the Kaksar movement within the next six months and to ensure that they had all the military paraphernalia needed to achieve this goal. But that was not all. Prior to this order, Mashriki had already taken the revolutionary step of issuing currency notes with different denominations under his own signature. These notes were adorned with symbols of his nation's identity, a star, a crescent, and the map of India itself. This was a powerful statement of defiance against the British, and a clear indication that Mashriki was determined to lead India towards its long-awaited freedom. In an interview with the National Archives of Pakistan, Kaksar veteran Sher Zaman recounts that the situation was this. The UP ministry ended, which was a significant incident. Upon this victory, the Punjab government became nervous, and in fact the government of India became extremely worried. Soon after returning from Lucknow, Mashriki issued a gazette appointing a governor in each province and officers at the district and division levels throughout India up to Burma, all of whom were top-level individuals. He ordered that each governor have significant power with thousands of soldiers, horses and weapons at their disposal. Upon reading this proclamation, the government became worried. Newspapers reported that Alama Mashriki had formed a parallel government and it was very likely that as soon as he attained power, he would take over the government. The government of India wrote to all provinces to keep a vigilant eye on the Kaksar movement. Mashriki's relentless anti-British activities had always irked the ruling powers, prompting them to adopt a shrewd strategy of enlisting influential Islamic religious authorities to bolster their cause. These supposed beneficiaries of the ruling powers had already been hurling scathing criticisms at Mashriki's published works, including his monumental and seminal commentary on the Holy Quran, Tazkira. Despite the fact that Mashriki's entire life and the Kaksar movement's principles were deeply rooted in Islamic teachings, several of these so-called men of faith had the temerity to label him an infidel. Their brazen and baseless accusations were part of a politically motivated propaganda campaign to appease the rulers and safeguard their own privileged status and resources bestowed upon them by the ruling powers. 
Mashriki's bold move to issue currency and his thunderous proclamation sent shockwaves through the British rulers, who recognized the threat it posed to their Raj. With astute maneuvering, they rallied influential Muslim and Hindu leaders to their cause and swiftly moved to arrest Mashriki and crush the Kaksar movement. These leaders wasted no time in supporting the rulers, as it was crucial for them to align with the British to safeguard their political aspirations and ensure their continued influence. They foresaw the end of their careers if Mashriki were to ascend to power. For instance, Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, the premier of Punjab, falsely declared the non-communal Kaksar movement to be a communal organization in the Punjab Legislative Assembly to show that its existence posed a grave threat to peace. As the British authorities were the most powerful regime in the world, they had great influence and used their cronies and resources to ruthlessly launch a campaign of domestic and global anti-Mashriki propaganda. Radio stations broadcasted anti-Mashriki news, and newspapers from various corners of the world carried catchy headlines such as Muslims Find a Hitler, India's Three Million Fascists, Indian fascists, new Muslim order, Muslim Nazis move exposed, India, spade carners, Muslim fascists seek world dominion, leader is an Oxford graduate, fascists body formed by Muslims, Oxford man as a leader, and Oxford man Führer of Muslim fascists. The media labeled Mashriki as an Oxford man. Even though he never attended Oxford University, it was a clear sign of their frantic fear, labeling Mashriki Führer, or the Kaksars, Muslim Nazis, or implying a link to Nazis, was nothing but a politically biased attempt to sow fear both in India and abroad. These allegations were meant to justify Mashriki's arrest and the crushing of the Kaksar movement in order to safeguard British rule. It's unfortunate that unfounded propaganda was launched against Mashriki and his Kaksar followers, despite their humanitarian services for Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Jews, and others since 1930. The Kaksar ideology was based on the following principles. Firstly, respect for the religious and social sentiments of all communities, including Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Parsis, Christians, Jews, and untouchables. Secondly, the maintenance of their particular culture and customs. Thirdly, general tolerance, which the Kaksars believed to be the secret of Muslim rule in India for a thousand years. The Kaksars stood for the establishment of an order that would be equal, non-communal, and tolerant, yet non-subservient. They aimed to achieve this by crushing all communal sentiment and religious prejudices through their good and serviceful conduct. Their order would provide proper treatment and protection to all communities, founded on eternal justice, goodness, and goodwill. In summary, the ideals of the Kaksars were peace, amity, brotherhood, and service, irrespective of caste or creed. They believed in one God, one humanity, and one practical religion, which means goodness in action. Let's uphold these noble ideals and promote harmony and goodwill among all communities. Take a look at these images. However, in February 1940, the British authorities implemented their plan to suppress the Kaksar movement by imposing restrictions. In the words of Prof. Dr. Rafiq Ahmed, the late Vice Chancellor of the Punjab University, the Punjab government imposed restrictions on marches, which were met with disapproval from the Kaksars. This move prompted Kaksar protests on March 19, 1940, in Lahore.
Unfortunately, tragedy ensued when the police opened fire on the Kaksars who were peacefully demonstrating. Over 200 Kaksars were brutally massacred, according to unofficial figures, and several others were injured. The unofficial figures appear to be correct, as the police record keeper's register indicates that 1,620 rounds were issued, but only 1,213 were returned. This means that 407 bullets were fired. The police constables went even further by removing turbans from the injured coxars, tying their feet and or necks, and dragging them like dogs. Some of the injured individuals were kicked and thrown from the balcony of Iqbal Manzil. The cruelty didn't stop there. Bleeding coxars who asked for water were silenced with batons, and the policemen on horseback showed no mercy, trampling over dead and injured bodies. Despite the heinous act of murder, there were many stories of profound bravery as they stood up against the ban that was keeping them from attaining their goals. In his book, Al Mashriki, Dr. Rashid Nisar narrated the heartbreaking dedication of the Kaksars to uphold the dignity of the movement's flag. He wrote that on that day, Zaig Ham Shahid, who held the flag, did not allow it to fall, despite the fact that bullets had riddled his body. He passed on the flag to Sadiq Shahid, who also upheld the flag even after he had taken bullets to his leg. Those who were present during this incident can attest to the incredible determination and resilience displayed by the wounded Kaksars. Despite being under a hail of bullets, they continued to pass the flag amongst themselves, ensuring it remained flying high. Another remarkable incident highlighted the unwavering integrity of the Kaksars. In this particular case, Author and journalist Mohammed Saeed described the incident in his book, Lahore, a memoir, with these words. A wounded coxar had dragged himself up to the shop and lifted an orange in order to quench his thirst. But his end came too soon and he died before he could strip the peel from it. Nevertheless, he had managed to pull the coin out of his blood-drenched pocket and leave it for the vendor to collect. आप अंदाजा कीजिए कि ये जो शालम दरवाजे के बाहर हादसा हुआ जिसमें काफी बड़ी तादाद में खाकसार शहीद हुए उसमें ऐसा भी हुआ बाद मौकों के ऊपर लोग प्यान करते हैं कि एक आदमी जो है वो दुनिया सुरक्षित हो रहा है उसका गला कट गया है वो अब खून बह रहा है और पानी उसने मांगा है तो कोई पानी लेके आगे बढ़ा है तो वो दवन्नी या इकन्नी या टका निकाल के पेश कर रहा है उसको क्योंकि अल्लामा साहब का हुक्म यही था कि आपने बगैर मुआवजे के कोई चीज नहीं लेनी इस मामले में वो आखिरी दर्जे में थे मेहमान भी कहीं जाए तो उसका मुआवजा देने की कोशिश करते थे तो इस तरह की बात जो डिसिप्लिन या नज़म की चीजें हैं वो उनका इम्तियाज बन गई थी और इसके लिहाज से एक बड़ी गैर मामूली शख्सियत थे ऐसी शख्सियत रोज रोज पैदा नहीं होती उनकी जहानत उनकी फतानत अपने इलम के साथ उनकी महारत ये सब बड़ी गैर मामूली थी उन्होंने ऐसे लोग तैयार कर दिए Gamidi also echoes the story of a Kaksar who, despite being wounded, dragged himself to a shop, hoping to quench his thirst with an orange. However, he died before he could peel it. He managed to pull a coin from his blood-drenched pocket and left it for the vendor before he passed away. This exemplifies the discipline and integrity of Mashriki's followers, who never accepted anything for free. Mashriki was a remarkable individual with exceptional wisdom and expertise, and such personalities are not born every day. Gamidi also says he created followers who were willing to sacrifice everything. Furthermore, these anecdotes, along with the ones mentioned earlier, vividly demonstrate the unwavering dedication of the Kaksars to Alama Mashriki's teachings. Their adherence to principles such as honesty, righteousness, and courageousness shines through these stories, reflecting the profound impact of Mashriki's ideology on their lives. Even in the face of imminent death, the Kaksars remained resolute, embodying the values instilled in them by their leader. Gamidi's assertion that Mashriki created followers who were willing to sacrifice everything further accentuates the exceptional character of both Mashriki and those he influenced. These powerful examples validate and establish how the Kaksar's deep devotion to Mashriki's ideology shaped their actions and solidified their commitment to their principles and goals. On the day of the Kaksar massacre, at 5.45 p.m., the police and military forces raided the Kaksar headquarters and Mashriki's adjacent house. 
They showed no regard for the sanctity of Mashriki's home, where his Purda-observing women resided. Tear gas grenades were recklessly fired, gravely injuring Mashriki's son, Esanullah Khan Aslam. His sons and the Kaksars present at the headquarters were arrested, while both premises were ransacked, vandalized, and the materials of the Kaksar movement were confiscated. That night, Mashriki, who was in Delhi, was arrested by Senior Superintendent of Police D. Kilburn and subsequently transferred to the distant Velore Central Jail in South India. Kept isolated in a solitary cell, authorities took extreme measures to prevent any contact between Mashriki and the outside world. Furthermore, constant surveillance was maintained on Kaksar headquarters and Mashriki's house. The next day, on March 20th, a gazette was issued declaring the Kaksar movement unlawful in New Delhi as well. The city of Lahore was essentially under emergency laws. Carrying of arms was prohibited. A curfew was imposed, and the police and the military patrolled the streets. In Lahore, a memoir, veteran journalist Saeed vividly depicted the situation. Censorship of the news, no processions, no speeches, no mention of the organization which was declared unlawful. The dead were not mentioned as martyrs or the living as heroes. The newspaper columns were to carry only the government version. In the aftermath of the Kaksar massacre and the subsequent disturbing events, both male and female Kaksars displayed unwavering bravery in their campaign of civil disobedience. What truly set the Kaksar movement apart was the unprecedented and fearless participation of uniformed Kaksar women proudly parading with spades and the Kaksar flag through the streets. Among them, a remarkable figure was Saida Bano, a ten-year-old girl from Delhi. Despite her young age, she served as a fiery speaker and led the women's Kaksar contingent with a Kaksar red flag. Many of these brave women were arrested for their participation. To address the unique challenges posed by Kaksar women's activism in street politics, the government took an unprecedented step by recruiting female police for the first time in South Asian history a groundbreaking development. In addition to the Kaksar men and women, Mashriki's female family members, who were also involved in the Kaksar movement, were not spared. Like their male counterparts, they faced threats, harassment, and the very real possibility of physical harm, abduction, or even death. These threats came from both state and non-state actors, creating an unimaginable ordeal for women especially considering the social environment and their young age during that era. The aim of these attempts to instill fear and intimidation was to force Mashriki to disband the Kaksar movement. However, the Kaksar men, women, and Mashriki's family members remained steadfast and refused to yield to these intimidations. It is crucial to recognize and appreciate the indispensable support provided by the wives of the Kaksars, whose assistance played a vital role in enabling the participation of the Kaksars in their activities. Moreover, it is of utmost importance to note that during that era, while women in Europe and America were still striving for equal rights, Mashriki in the 1930s empowered women within the Kaksar movement in an extraordinary manner. He instilled in them tremendous courage, leading even veiled women, who were culturally expected to remain confined to their homes, to willingly take to the streets and fight for their nation's freedom. After the police fired on the Kaksars on March 19th, Lahore was engulfed in profound gloom. Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, the Punjab premier and a member of the Working Committee of Jinnah's All India Muslim League, was held responsible for the Kaksar killings. In an attempt to avoid public anger, Sir Sikander suggested to Jinnah the postponement of the Muslim League session scheduled for March 22 to 24, 1940, at Minto Park, later Iqbal Park in Lahore. However, Jinnah disregarded the suggestion, choosing to exploit the Kaksar tragedy for political advantage, a common tactic among politicians. On March 21, 1940, Jinnah arrived in the city to attend the Muslim League session. Jinnah went to the Mayo Hospital and visited the wounded Kaksars.
उनको कहेंगे कि इसकी इसके बारे में तहकीकात करें डॉक्टर रफीक अहमद मेंशंस दैट जिना मेट द इंजर्ड काकसार्स एट द हॉस्पिटल एंड प्रॉमिस्ड टू ब्रिंग अटेंशन टू देयर इश्यूज बाय रिक्वेस्टिंग द पंजाब गवर्नमेंट टू इन्वेस्टिगेट द इंसिडेंट दिस वाज नेसेसरी टू सीक द गुड विल ऑफ बोथ द काकसार्स एंड द जनरल पब्लिक ऑन मार्च 22 1940 Jinnah and other Muslim leaguers arrived to attend the 27th session of the All India Muslim League at Minto Park, later known as Iqbal Park, in Lahore at 2:45 p.m. Sensing the public sentiment for the Kaksars, sympathy banners had already been displayed at the site stating, "We demand that the Punjab government appoint an independent inquiry committee. We will not remain silent until justice is delivered to the Kaksars." tens of thousands of people including men and women kaksars flocked to the venue driven by sympathy for the kaksar murder and fueled by anti-government sentiments against the suppression of the kaksar movement they presented various demands including compensation for the murdered and injured kaksars the release of mashriki his sons and the kaksars an independent inquiry into the tragedy and the lifting of the ban on the kaksar movement The crowd boiled with fury as on March 19th the police callously disregarded the sanctity of Mashriki's home where his purda observing women resided. Tear gas grenades were indiscriminately launched causing serious injuries to Mashriki's son Asanullah Khan Aslam. Mashriki's sons and the Kaksars present at the scene were ruthlessly apprehended. Meanwhile, Mashriki's house and the Kaksar headquarters were ravaged, vandalized, and the invaluable materials of the Kaksar movement were brutally seized. Now let's hear from Dr. Ahmed as he reflects on the turnout at this session. बहुत बड़ा पिंडाल था अंदर और बाहर वो भरा हुआ था और बाद के जो हमने किताबें पढ़ी हैं उसमें लोग क्लेम करते हैं कि एक लाख के करीब Dr. Ahmed described the scene, emphasizing the magnitude of the venue and the massive turnout. It was a massive venue, packed both inside and outside. According to the books we have read, they claim that there were around 100,000 people in attendance. There were definitely no fewer than 100,000 people present. Although I did not count, I can confirm that it was a gigantic venue, fully packed. A large number of people were even standing outside the venue making it a huge gathering. It is said that there has never been a bigger rally than this in Lahore. However, Dr. Ahmed did not mention the crowd's sympathy for the Kaksar movement issues. Following a devastating tragedy, Lahore was engulfed in gloom and sorrow. Many Kaksars were brutally killed. Their leader Mashriki was unjustly imprisoned far from home, and Mashriki's son and other injured Kaksars were on their deathbeds. Kaksar homes were raided and numerous Kaksars were unjustly arrested. In such a devastating context, expecting 100,000 emotionally distraught people to gather at Iqbal Park and engage with the Muslim League's speeches or resolutions would be naive. During times of despair and grief, people prioritize coping with their emotions and seeking comfort rather than being interested in politics. It is also important to note that at that time the All India Muslim League had no support in Punjab and people were unaware of the upcoming Lahore resolution which would later be known as the Pakistan resolution Jinnah or the Muslim League had never attracted such a large crowd anywhere in India the Punjab premier Sir Sikandar who wanted to postpone the session chose not to mobilize the crowd to avoid embarrassment as he was responsible for the Kaksar murder During the interview, author Sana Ula Akhtar asked former Pakistani ambassador and deputy chief of general staff of the Pakistan Army, Muhammad Ibrahim Qureshi, about the March 19th tragedy. In response, Qureshi stated that the public was deeply saddened by the incident and their reaction was very strong. When the first session of the Muslim League started around 3 p.m., despite the tremendous expectations, Jinnah in his speech continued talking about the Muslim League's achievements and refrained from bringing up the Kaksar subject. Demonstrations occurred and shouts of Sikandar Moor Dabad, down with Sikandar, were raised. A Muslim woman angrily climbed the stage and expressed her frustration that the Kaksar issue had not yet been addressed. She demanded that the Kaksar issue be taken up first. The crowd applauded her sentiments and agreed with her. 
Jinnah stopped the speech and immediately comforted her, saying the session would not conclude without resolving the Kaksar issue. The crowd thunderously chanted slogans in favor of Mashriki and the Kaksars, such as Alama Mashriki Zindabad, Long Live Alama Mashriki, Kaksar Zindabad, Long Live Kaksars, Esanullah Khan Aslam Zindabad, Long Live Esanullah Khan Aslam. The following day, on March 23rd at 3.30 p.m., the second open session of the Muslim League commenced. Once again, a demonstration took place. Later, during the night session, another demonstration erupted. In both sessions, the same type of slogans favoring Kaksars and opposing the government, which had been voiced the previous day, resurfaced once again. The crowd was growing increasingly angry as the issue of the Kaksars had not been addressed. Their anger reached a point where they were on the verge of disrupting the session. To regain control of the situation, the National Guards of the Muslim League swiftly rushed to the stage, blowing their whistles to summon more assistance. Consequently, the subject committee meeting was temporarily adjourned. The crowd fervently demanded that the issues regarding the Kaksars be addressed as a matter of priority. In response to the unrest, Jinnah made an appeal to the people urging them to exercise patience and maintain order and tranquility. He assured them that the matter would be thoroughly examined by the subject's committee and would not be swayed by any external influences. Jinnah promised that the issue would be taken up by the committee that very night, and they would only adjourn after reaching a final decision. Despite these reassurances, the Muslim League meeting adjourned that night with the intention to reconvene at 10 a.m. the following morning, which was very upsetting for the Kaksars and the crowd at the session. There were several reasons for the delay. Firstly, the Muslim League was divided over the Kaksar issue, resulting in fear of a party split. Secondly, Sir Sikander wanted a resolution that would protect his own interests. Thirdly, a resolution had to be passed that would not incite violence on the streets of India, as that would have certainly displeased the British rulers, which the Muslim League could not afford. Fourthly, the League wanted to pass a resolution that could provide solace to the angered public. They planned to pass the resolution on the last day during the late-night session so that if the public did not approve of it, they could terminate the session. Lastly, the Muslim League sought a resolution that would improve their standing and generate goodwill among the people. On March 24th, the last day of the Muslim League session, the police fired tear gas and made arrests of demonstrating Kaksars in Anarkali, and Dubi Bazaar in Lahore. These rallies were against the government, and also aimed to express their discontent with the Muslim League for its failure to address the grievances of the Kaksar Tariq and get Kaksar's demands accepted. As a sign of solidarity with the Kaksars, not only did the public but also shopping centers remained closed, and the masses showed immense support and sympathy for the Kaksars. As usual, the public and the Kaksars gathered at the session's venue. Right when the proceedings started, people from the audience shouted, What about the Kaksars? The Amrita Bazaar Patrika Daily newspaper reported, The proceedings were frequently punctuated with Kaksar slogans. In light of this, Nawabzada Liaquat Ali Khan, feeling a sense of nervousness, promptly assured the gathering that a resolution on the Kaksar question would be placed before the open session when it met that night. At the evening session, an atmosphere of subdued excitement prevailed as the announcement of the Kaksar resolution drew near. The enthusiasm reached its peak when Jinnah, amidst cheers, stood up and made the long-awaited announcement regarding the Kaksar resolution adopted by the All India Muslim League. The aforementioned resolution ignited a wave of jubilation, accompanied by resounding slogans such as Alama Mashriki Zindabad, Long Live Alama Mashriki, Kaksar Zindabad, Long live Kaksars, Jinnah Zindabad, Long live Jinnah, and Sikander Murdabad, death to Sir Sikander. The Kaksar resolution itself conveyed profound sympathy for the martyred Kaksars and their grieving families, while also demanding a thorough investigation into the killings of Kaksars and urging the removal of the ban on the Kaksar Tariq. In his concluding statement, Jinnah expressed his distress about the firing incident involving the Kaksars. According to the daily newspaper, The Tribune, Jinnah was quoted as saying, I was very much perturbed when I learned about the firing on the Kaksars. 
It felt as if my life had been shortened by ten years upon hearing about this tragic event in Lahore. Despite being advised against holding the session of the League, I had complete faith in my people, and thus decided not to postpone the session. It is noteworthy that although both the Kaksar Resolution and the Pakistan Resolution were adopted during the same session, it is surprising that the Kaksar Resolution is neither acknowledged nor referenced at the famous monument, Minari Pakistan, situated in Lahore. There isn't even a monument dedicated to the Kaksar martyrs who sacrificed their lives for freedom at the location where the brutal massacre took place. These martyrs are among those whose sacrifices enabled the freedom enjoyed by the people in the Indian subcontinent. The same is true for Indians and Bangladeshis, as their history also completely overlooks the sacrifices made by Alama Mashriki and his followers. This reflects the narrow-mindedness, extreme bias, and discrimination perpetuated by the Pakistani, Indian, and Bangladeshi establishments, which also hide the truth about Mashriki and his followers' role in the freedom movement. These facts have been kept under the rug for various reasons, as later uncovered in this documentary. Furthermore, Jinnah's refusal to postpone the Muslim session and his strategic exploitation of the Kaksar tragedy yielded significant rewards. For instance, the tragedy drew a huge crowd, generating widespread attention for Jinnah and the Muslim League, as the number of attendees may not have exceeded a few thousand due to the Muslim League's standing at the time. Jinnah's hospital visit, impassioned speeches advocating for the Kaksars, and public display of empathy, including the placement of banners proclaiming justice will be served to Kaksars and demanding an impartial inquiry, greatly enhanced his popularity. The government held an inquiry, but its report was never published, and Jinnah never demanded its release. The Kaksar resolution was merely superficial, as nothing came out of it. However, by providing solace to the Kaksars and successfully passing the Kaksar resolution, Jinnah's fame surged while Sir Sikander's influence dwindled, ultimately leading to his political downfall. However, despite capitalizing on the Kaksar tragedy for his political gain, Jinnah later distanced himself from the Kaksars. Approximately six weeks later, on May 8, 1940, he made a statement disassociating the Kaksar organization from the Muslim League, saying, The Kaksar organization is entirely independent of the Muslim League. I have sympathy with it but I'm helpless. This change in stance resulted in deep disappointment among the Kaksars and the general public, as they had expected Jinnah to maintain a consistent position in supporting their cause. It is a common occurrence among politicians to exploit tragedies and sentiments for their own benefit, only to discard their promises once they have achieved their goals, and Jinnah was no exception. Prior to moving forward, it is crucial to discuss the public reaction to the Pakistan Resolution. The adoption of the resolution shocked and angered the masses across the entire Indian subcontinent, including Muslims of all sects, as well as Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, and followers of other faiths. Strong speeches, conferences, and the passing of resolutions characterized the wave of opposition that spread throughout India. As a result, both Muslim and non-Muslim leadership vehemently opposed it. The media reported their reactions, which you can see on the screen. Muslim League resolution is mischievous. It is derogatory to the self-respect of Mohammedans. Pakistan's scheme is anti-Islamic. It is Mr. Jinnah's stunt. Musalman condemn Pakistan's scheme. It is un-Islamic. Two-nation theory based on wrong premises. India is our common home. We have to live and die here. Ruse to keep India under British domination. No sensible Muslim will accept Pakistan's scheme. Muslims shout Pakistan scheme Murdabad. Pathans will break Pakistan into pieces. Sinister move to create Ulster in India will be resisted. Pakistan scheme is absurd and impracticable. Designed to deceive ignorant masses. Partition scheme is impracticable. It is harmful to Muslim interests. Pakistan scheme is harmful. It seeks to create another Palestine under British mandate. Mr. Jinnah's scheme will lead to disaster. Religion should be eliminated from civics and politics. Unislamic Muslim League scheme. Muslim League body of self-seekers. They are misleading masses in the name of religion. Mr. Jinnah's statement is a slur on the fair name of Islam. Pakistan. Fantastic and impracticable. Mr. Jinnah is a political juggler. Powerful tradition of unity. Hindus and Muslims. Shia opposed to Pakistan. 
I will employ every non-violent means to prevent vivisection of India. Iqbal did not think of dividing India. Jinnah a tool of the Viceroy. Promoters of Pakistan are playboys of British imperialism. Jinnah playing role of Mir Jaffer. This criticism of the Pakistan resolution and Jinnah was genuine because, instead of uniting the nation to end British rule, particularly amidst the favorable circumstances of World War II, Jinnah chose to promote communalism, which was going to fuel hate between Muslims and Hindus and advance the divide and rule policy of the rulers. Mashriki, in his prison cell, agonized over Jinnah's selfish politics, which to him would delay attaining freedom and ultimately the collapse of the British Empire, which depended on India's freedom and play into the hands of the British during the war. Indeed, the Pakistan Resolution inadvertently aided the British in maintaining their rule for nearly another seven years following its adoption. The reaction to the resolution stemmed from the fact that no one wanted the division of their own country, which would separate families and friends. Additionally, there were various reasons why it was perceived as a British idea. Firstly, after the Kaksar massacre, Section 144 was implemented in Lahore, prohibiting gatherings of more than five people in one place. However, the ban was lifted to allow the Muslim League session to be held. This leniency further supports the notion that the British authorities were actively involved in promoting the Pakistan Resolution. Secondly, influential British figures, such as Sir Henry Duffield Craik, were present at a garden party for Jinnah hosted by Sir Sikander on the night the resolution was passed. This raises questions about their true motives and implies that the British had a vested interest in supporting the resolution, potentially for their own political objectives. Thirdly, the Kaksar massacre and Mashriki's arrest ignited anger and resentment against the British rulers among the nation. To divert public attention during this tumultuous period, the British did not hinder the presentation of the resolution by Jinnah. This tactic aimed to prevent a widespread uprising during World War II. Moreover, if the two-nation theory and the resolution were not British creations, Jinnah would not have been allowed to present them. If he did, they would have immediately arrested Jinnah for treason, as he called for dividing the country and promoting communalism. They would have argued that the said theory and resolution posed a threat to peace. Furthermore, the British strategically promoted a contradictory proposal that served their interests. They instructed Jinnah to promote it, and would have ceased its promotion if it didn't benefit them. The division between Muslims and Hindus was essential for the British to sustain their rule. The lack of opposition from British authorities and the free hand given to Jinnah raised suspicions of British involvement, and suggested tacit approval or even active support from the British rulers. The two-nation theory, which proposed the creation of a separate country for Muslims, was perceived as contradictory to the teachings of Islam. Moreover, the idea of demanding a separate country for Muslims in areas where they already held political power made no sense. Furthermore, the geographical challenge of forming a country with Bengal, a Muslim-majority region over 1,000 miles away from India, posed a significant hurdle. Considering these reasons and the widespread opposition to the Pakistan resolution from various Muslim leaders and communities, except for the Muslim League and its supporters, it becomes difficult to dismiss the notion that the adoption of the resolution, which later resulted in the creation of Pakistan, was not British political maneuvering, with Jinnah being utilized as a tool. Furthermore, Jinnah willingly served British interests, as many leaders do, by being accepted as the sole leader of Muslims at a time when he had no political standing in all provinces, such as Punjab and the northwest frontier provinces, now Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Both Jinnah and the British working together are also evident from what the Viceroy of India, Lord Linlithgow, wrote to the Secretary of State Lord Zetland on May 14, 1940. We both are, of course, aware that there is a not unimportant Muslim element outside the Muslim League. Indeed, I am sure that Jinnah remains the man to deal with on the Muslim side. The Viceroy did not mince his words when he wrote to the Secretary of State that Jinnah is our man, and we accept him as a representative of all Muslims. Regarding Jinnah's claim that the Muslim minority would be suppressed by the Hindu majority in India, it was a fallacious ploy designed to instill fear and rally support for Pakistan. Jinnah conveniently overlooked the fact that Muslims, despite being a minority, held the reins of power in India for centuries. 
He also ignored the centuries of amicable coexistence between Muslims and Hindus until the British introduced their divisive divide-and-rule policy. The British sowed the seeds of religious animosity and exploited communal differences to maintain control over India. Consider, for instance, the relatively small number, less than 100,000 of the British presence in India, ruling over vast multitudes consisting of millions. The vastness of the British Empire they created around the world stands as a testament to their remarkable capabilities and deserves unreserved admiration. History has shown that true power lies in exceptional individuals who leave an indelible mark on the world stage rather than mere quantity. Jinnah's alarmist notion that Islam faced peril in India was a baseless fabrication aimed at sowing fear among Muslims, lacking a solid foundation. History like all human endeavors, is filled with shades of gray, and even the most revered figures are not exempt from the flaws and darker aspects of their lives. As we continue to uncover previously hidden or lesser-known facts of our history, it is important not only to disclose more facts, such as those about Jinnah's politics, but also to shed light on the actions of the British rulers, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. However, before delving into these aspects, it is crucial to approach this discussion with an open mind and a spirit of empathy. As we uncover some disturbing facts throughout this documentary about these iconic individuals and the British rulers, we must bear in mind that the purpose here is not to belittle them, but rather to deepen our understanding of their politics and legacies. These facts, although unsettling for many, are an integral part of history that needs to be uncovered. It is worth noting that Jinnah and Sir Sikander were not the only figures who supported the British rulers in crushing the Kaksar movement. Gandhi, the advocate of non-violence, remained silent on the killings and violence inflicted upon the Kaksars. Instead, he congratulated Sir Sikander for his actions against the Kaksar movement and penned an anti-Kaksar article in Harijan stating, No power, whether foreign or Swadeshi, can tolerate private armies. He said, I am sure that the Punjab government will not permit the Kaksar organization to be revived. He further suggested, If I had my way, I would ask the people to meet Kaksar violence with non-violence. Gandhi forgot that the Kaksars had never committed any violence since the birth of the Kaksar movement in 1930. He also forgot their community service to Muslims, Hindus, and other non-Muslims. Right after the massacre, did they kill anyone or even attempt to attack Sir Sikander or burn any buildings? Gandhi's calling Kaksars to be violent was nothing but politically motivated. Inflicting violence was not part of the Alama Mashriki Kaksar movement's ideology. Nevertheless, it is worth mentioning that he did not condemn the acts of violence inflicted upon the Kaksars on March 19th, including Mashriki's sons and Esanullah Khan Aslam even when the latter was on his deathbed. Furthermore, during the freedom movement, hundreds of Kaksars were killed, and thousands of Kaksars were thrown in jail, where they faced terrible violence. Yet, Gandhi never uttered a word condemning the violence during this period of struggle for independence. It is important to note that during Gandhi's visit to a Kaksar camp in Peshawar in 1938, he was deeply influenced by the Kaksars, which prompted him to establish a peace brigade in India, replicating the Kaksar movement. However, despite his earnest attempts, his efforts to create a similar movement did not bear fruit. If the Kaksar movement's dogma was violence, then why did he try to replicate his brigade on Kaksar movement's lines? The historic events clearly confirm that Gandhi's non-violence was selective and intended to protect British rule in India. This is why the rulers kept him and his supporters in the limelight. It should be noted that Gandhi was not mistreated in prison. For instance, at Aga Khan Palace, where he was confined, he had his secretary and wife by his side and engaged in other leisure activities. Describing the Aga Khan Palace as a prison is utterly preposterous. Nehru also criticized the Kaksar methods as injurious to the country. After a well-arranged military salute given in his honor by the Punjab Kaksars, he was reported to have remarked, he wished this had been Congress, with another person close to him adding that the Kaksars had achieved in the space of three or four years what Congress had not been able to achieve in the space of fifty years. Nehru, who was with Mashriki at Cambridge University, similar to Jinnah and Gandhi, did not demand Mashriki's release, 
visit him in jail, offer moral support to his family, or visit Mashriki's critically ill son. The reason they felt threatened by Mashriki's street power became evident. This was a crucial moment when Jinnah, Gandhi, Nehru, and other leaders should have stood by Mashriki, rallying against British rule. Instead, they sided with the British to safeguard their political careers, unwilling to risk antagonizing the rulers, which would have spelled the end of their own political aspirations. Additionally, their fear of Mashriki assuming power meant the demise of these men's political careers. To them, self-interest was more important than what was good for the nation. If they had not succumbed to their selfish motives, British rule could have ended in 1940. Amidst this backdrop of political discontent and widespread disillusionment, a heart-wrenching sadness descended upon India as news of Esanullah Khan Aslam's death spread like wildfire. Aslam had fallen victim to police brutality on March 19, 1940, ultimately succumbing to his injuries on May 31st. The government's seizure of the Mashriki's bank accounts had left Aslam without proper medical care, and doctors were too afraid of government action against them to offer him assistance. It was a cruel fate that befell this young hero, who had become a symbol of hope for the oppressed, a voice for the voiceless, and a freedom fighter for those who yearned for freedom. As the news of his death reached the masses, it brought forth an overwhelming wave of resentment and indignation against the government's oppressive actions. Undeterred by the oppressive government measures and fueled by a deep sense of solidarity, the people of India rallied together to honor the memory of Esanullah Khan Aslam. Their collective grief and admiration were evident as over 50,000 individuals congregated at the Golden Mosque in Lahore, determined to pay their respects to this fearless young man. The funeral procession, led by uniformed Kaksars, solemnly carried Aslam's mortal remains draped in the Kaksar flag. The air reverberated with the echoes of a 101-gun salute, symbolizing the utmost respect and honor bestowed upon the departed soul. Undaunted, the public followed the Kaksars with solemn steps as they made their way towards the grounds of the Miani Sahib graveyard, their hearts heavy with grief and determination. The magnitude of Islam's impact was evident in the overwhelming response to his funeral, marking it as the largest procession ever witnessed for a teenager in the region's history. Every step of the mourners resonated with a deep sense of loss and admiration as they chanted slogans in his honor, filling the air with a charged atmosphere of emotion. Their heartfelt voices served as a powerful testament to the profound love and respect bestowed upon this young hero. Amidst the tears and sobs, Aslam was laid to rest, his final farewell marred by the absence of his father, who remained incarcerated, unable to bid his son a final goodbye. The scene was heart-wrenching, etched into the collective memory of those present. Yet even in the face of such sorrow, Aslam's legacy remained vibrant and enduring. His bravery and passion for freedom continued to inspire future generations, igniting their resolve to fight for their rights and beliefs. His untimely death served as a catalyst, further fueling the flames of the freedom movement. Aslam's sacrifice eternally resides in the annals of history, ensuring that he will forever be remembered as a hero of the people. His legacy serves as a beacon, guiding generations to come, reminding them of the power of conviction and the indomitable spirit that can shape the course of a nation's destiny. The March 1940 Kaksar massacre, the tragic loss of Mashriki's son, and the heart-wrenching refusal of the British authorities to allow him to attend the funeral inflicted deep wounds on British rule in the Indian subcontinent. The torment continued as Mashriki, the valiant Kaksars, and their families endured unspeakable torture, relentless harassment, and menacing death threats. These haunting events brought immense suffering and despair. Yet despite the passage of time, the British government remained silent, neglecting to acknowledge their role or offer a meaningful apology. It was vital that recognition and reconciliation were embraced, allowing the healing of these profound scars engraved in the pages of British rule in the Indian subcontinent. All these events are remembered as dark days in the history of India. Since the year the Kaksar murder took place, every year thereafter, 
Kaksar Martyrs Day has been solemnly observed on March 19th by Mashriki's followers. Speeches were delivered to enlighten the public about both tragedies, and Kaksars and others visited the Miyani Sahib graveyard in Lahore to pay their respects to these martyrs. In 2013, Mr. Nassim Yusuf, Mashriki's grandson and his biographer, passionately called for the British government to apologize for the Kaksar massacre in a newspaper article titled, Kaksar Massacre on March 19, 1940, Call for UK Apology. Apart from this work, the author has written many pieces on the subject. However, the British government has yet to acknowledge and render their apology for what they did to Mashriki, his family, and the Kaksars. Hopefully, they will do so soon. Amidst the ongoing pursuit of acknowledgement and resolution, Mashriki's grandson, Mr. Yusuf, received a heartfelt message from the grandson of Senior Superintendent of Police Donald Gainsford, one of the officers responsible for the firing on the Kaksars on March 19th. It was a gratifying experience to receive such a compassionate message from Gainsford's grandson. In response, we expressed our gratitude to him for consenting to share his message publicly. The following is the content of his message. Dear Sir, I am emailing you because I read an article that you wrote in which I discovered something I didn't not know, and that fills me with shame. My grandfather was Superintendent D. Gainsford, who was responsible for the massacre on March 19th. I don't know what I expect to get from this reaching out, except to offer my deepest sorrow and shame that my grandfather played such a part in this awful piece of history. I remember him as a kindly man with extensive injuries to his face, I believe, from being struck by a spade carried by one of the protesters. From one grandchild to another, from one side of history to the other, I send my brotherly love. As we eagerly anticipate an apology, it is important to recognize that the need for acknowledgement extends beyond the Kaksar massacre, as numerous other injustices warrant attention and illumination. Moreover, not only the establishment in the United Kingdom, but also in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, acknowledgement and recognition are yet to be provided as deservedly do. Freedom did not come easy. The documentary explores the heavy cost paid by Alama Mashriki, his family, and the male and female Kaksars in their pursuit of independence for the Indian subcontinent. These brave individuals faced unimaginable atrocities and hardships under British rule. The freedom enjoyed by the masses in the Indian subcontinent today is built on the sacrifices of these individuals. According to Kaksar veteran Hakim Ahmed Hussein's book, over 10,000 Kaksars were forcibly detained in various jails across the Punjab province. While some faced life imprisonment, others endured varying durations of imprisonment. The colonial authorities employed brutal methods to punish them, extract information, and force them to abandon the Kaksar movement. Common forms of torture in British India included whipping, flogging, waterboarding, electric shock, sleep deprivation, forced labor, sexual abuse, and burning with cigarettes. Many Kaksars were handcuffed and chained. They were confined to overcrowded and filthy cells without sunlight or windows, enduring scorching heat. They were not provided with blankets during the extreme cold weather, leaving them exposed to harsh conditions. The prisoners' rooms were infested with various insects such as bedbugs, mosquitoes, body lice, and ants. The conditions were unsanitary and lacked basic facilities. Medical treatment and food quality were poor, leading to the suffering of numerous coxars from diseases such as diarrhea, malaria, and typhoid. Several even died due to inhumane conditions and cruel treatment. In a letter dated October 27, 1943, addressed to Sir Richard Tottenham, Mashriki provided a glimpse into the harsh reality endured by the coxars in words to this effect. A relentless and most determined campaign is being waged against the Kaksars throughout India by the police, both in uniform and plain clothes. The Kaksars are subjected to abuse, insults, and intimidation simply because they identify as Kaksars. These acts are openly justified as government orders. Every received letter arrives after being forcibly opened and tainted with adhesive. Notably, Influential Kaksar individuals are persistently surveilled by plainclothes officers who trail their every step.
Now, in addition to Mashriki's account, it is important to note that the media had already unleashed propaganda by labeling the Kaksars as fifth columnists. Furthermore, amidst the persecution faced by Mashriki and the Kaksars, the British government made futile attempts to find a link between Mashriki and Hitler, as well as any funding from the Nazi leader, in order to justify his hanging for treason. However, their relentless efforts yielded no evidence against Mashriki. Nevertheless, he was unjustly detained in Valore Central Jail without trial and deprived of the appropriate categorization or classification for his confinement. As a result, Mashriki suffered from meager and deplorably poor quality food, as well as the abhorrent conditions of his cell, which eventually led to his severe illness. While in prison, Mashriki lay gravely unwell. He wrote a letter dated March 10, 1941, from jail to Dr. Rafiq Ahmed Khan, informing him of his impending fate. He wrote, My last days are nearing. It will be all right if I receive a reply and I am released. Otherwise, I am going to die. I am not going to change my decision, nor do I repent for it. I am happy because I am going to lay down my life. At the conclusion of his letter, Mashriki wrote, Again, gird up your loins. Do not let my face be blackened. We will all return home happily, else my dead body will reach you. There was a widespread belief that Mashriki was being slowly poisoned to ensure his demise. Fearing his impending death, Mashriki Day was observed throughout India on May 2, 1941. Special prayers and fasting were held for his release. Black flags were hung on houses, and numerous telegrams were sent to the Viceroy of India, urging Mashriki's release. When the government refused to grant his freedom, the Kaksars devised a plan to hijack Mashriki from jail. On May 16, 1941, from the depths of his prison cell, Mashriki defiantly dispatched a resounding message, one that resonated across the land. Published on the front page of Mashriki's journal, his words, or rather words to this effect, reverberated with unwavering conviction. Kaksar soldier, heed my words. Your duty, unwavering and unyielding, endures until the final objective is achieved. Do not allow the deceptive enemy to ensnare you in their treacherous games, nor succumb to the snares of the hypocrite. Stand tall, unswerving in your resolve, for the true path lies before you. Driven by concerns over Mashriki's resolve, the movement's growing popularity, and its potential to overthrow British rule on June 6, 1941, the Kaksar movement, initially banned in the Punjab province, was now banned throughout India. Thereafter, a large number of Kaksars were arrested from different parts of the country. Believing that freedom would only come with his sacrifice, on October 16, 1941, Mashriki embarked on a fast unto death demonstrating his willingness to die for the Indian subcontinent's independence. The British government demanded that Mashriki announce the disbandment of the Kaksar movement. However, Mashriki refused to succumb to any threats and firmly replied that the Kaksar movement was not his personal property that he could dispose of. As a result of fast, he was on deathbed. On December 21, 1941, Barrister Mian Ahmed Shah sent the following letter to Sir Richard Tottenham. His condition as I have seen him is dangerously serious, and nothing remains in his body except tissues. He cannot walk even two steps without leaning on something, nor can he talk even five or six sentences at a time. I am afraid he may break down any moment and finish. Moreover, the cell in which he has been put appears from its very size to be one in which convicts condemned to death are usually kept. If he were, therefore, to die, say, within a fortnight, this sort of solitary, dark, and unairy cell will certainly shorten his lingering life by a few days. From what I have seen of the Alama, I may say that he is nearing his death. Therefore, very urgently, I point out that his letter of 19th instant may be immediately favorably considered and his release ordered without any further loss of time. Fearing that Mashriki's death would lead to significant unrest in the country, the British government had no choice but to release him from jail on January 19, 1942, albeit with restricted movements. This decision was made in light of the resilience and sacrifices demonstrated by Mashriki and the Kaksars during this period. Their unwavering determination to fight for independence served to underscore the oppressive nature of British colonial rule in India. In March 1942, Cripps arrived with proposals. And on April 3rd, 
Mashriki was the first one to reject them and telegraph other leaders, stating that the Kaksar organization rejects Cripps's proposals in their entirety and considers them meaningless. Following Mashriki, other leaders followed suit. Furthermore, with restricted movement to end British rule, Mashriki attempted to form a united front with the All India Muslim League, the Indian National Congress, and the Hindu Mahasabha, assuring their leaders Emma Jinnah, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Jawaharlal Nehru, and V.D. Savarkar that he could bring about the end of British rule within months. In his telegram to their respective presidents, Mashriki declared, I fully undertake the responsibility of securing complete independence for India from the British government within six months. Mashriki's correspondence with these leaders was reproduced in the Radiance Weekly of Aligarh on February 6, 1943. The government disliked Mashriki for being the first one to reject Cripps's proposals and for influencing others to reject them, as well as for Mashriki's attempt to form a united front. The government of India sent a message to Mashriki threatening to arrest him. However, the masses were demanding, through a statement and resolution, that the restrictions be lifted and Mashriki be released completely. On 1942, October 23, 1942, Alilan newspaper wrote, The government of India may well labor under the delusion that they can end the Kaksar movement through a policy of complete taciturnity, which they have been adopting for some time past. The paper reminds the government that no movement has fizzled out in this way. On the other hand, it has gained momentum gradually. The efforts made by the government of India in 1940 to crush the movement have failed, because instead of weakening it, it has in fact considerably strengthened the movement much as the Kaksars have, by making valuable sacrifices, become hardy soldiers imbibed with an unconquerable spirit of achieving their goal. Mashriki reiterated his resolve to sacrifice his life in a telegram to the British government on December 12, 1942, stating, If I am not released by the 30th of December, then I will sacrifice my life by fighting with the police and will die in the path of the Lord, demanding that the government of India withdraw all restrictions from the Kaksar movement by the 17th of December and set me at liberty. Two days before Mashriki's deadline, meaning on December 28, 1942, the government of India released Mashriki and lifted the ban on the Kaksar movement. It is crucial to emphasize that despite the British government's determined efforts to establish a connection between Mashriki and Hitler and uncover evidence of funding from the latter, no proof was found. These relentless endeavors, which even involved imprisoning Mashriki for almost two years without a fair trial and maintaining restrictions on his movements for about another year without any legal proceedings, were widely seen as desperate measures to smear Mashriki's reputation, justify his imprisonment, and maintain British rule. In the end, the allegations linking Mashriki to Hitler were unequivocally discredited, underscoring the unjust treatment he endured. In the meantime, Jinnah, Abul Kalam Azad, Nehru, and Savarkar refrained from forming a united front with Mashriki due to their concerns about the potential consequences. They were well aware that such an alliance could displease the powerful rulers and jeopardize their political careers. Additionally, they recognized Mashriki's capability to swiftly end British rule, which would have ended their political careers. Consequently, they made the decision to overlook the nation's interests. Regardless of this, Mashriki continued to advocate for Muslim and Hindu unity and suggested Jinnah and Gandhi settle their differences, which were crucial to ending British rule. The confrontational politics between the two major communities were sowing seeds of discord and essentially aiding the British rulers in advancing their divide and rule policy. To counteract this, Mashriki not only preached Muslim-Hindu unity in his speeches, but also ordered the Kaksars to work towards fostering unity between Muslims and Hindus. However, Mashriki's relentless efforts to unite Muslims and Hindus and dismantle the divide and rule policy of the British incurred the wrath of the British rulers. This was evident from Mashriki's press statement on the momentous day of July 22, 1943, where he unambiguously asserted, It appears that the government of India would not let the Kaksars live or give to them even what is allowed to all others. 
The ban was raised on December 28th last after a terrible struggle of three years on clear and definite conditions put in my statement, which the government of India reproduced in their communique of that date. But these conditions were repudiated on January 25th. Since then, the government of India have threatened again and again that I shall be rearrested and the ban on the Kaksars reimposed unless the red symbol on the arm of the Kaksars is abolished, the gatherings of the Kaksars forbidden and their social service rendered individually. The latest warning of the 19th of July is that, if within a fortnight from that date, the red symbol is not removed from the arm of every Kaksar in India, and the display of spades, drills, marches, also collective service inside camps not abolished. The government of India will declare the Kaksars to be an unlawful association again. This is called the final warning. Three days after Mashriki made his statement, specifically on July 26th, an individual allegedly responsible for attacking Jinnah was identified as a Kaksar member. Jinnah took legal action and made every effort to prove that the assailant belonged to the Kaksar organization. However, the evidence presented was so feeble that Justice Blagden of the Bombay High Court rejected it, refusing to accept the claim that the attacker was a Kaksar. In light of Mashriki's resurgence in political activity, it becomes evident that the so-called assault was a premeditated attempt to undermine Mashriki's political standing. Several reasons support this assertion. Firstly, the fact that Jinnah's guards allowed an ordinary person to enter his residence is questionable. Additionally, why would Jinnah's secretary inform him about the arrival of a suspicious-looking individual? Moreover, why would Jinnah abandon his work and descend from the second floor of his house to meet an unknown and poorly dressed individual without any prior appointment? Then, the identification of the assailant as a coxar immediately after the attack, without any thorough investigation, raises serious suspicions. Moreover, it is exceedingly peculiar that Jinnah would initiate legal proceedings, unless driven by a concealed agenda, over a minor scratch that resulted in no significant harm. The entire narrative appears fabricated and bogus. Despite Jinnah's rigorous efforts to establish the assailant's affiliation with the Coxar organization in court, the arguments presented were so feeble that Justice Blagden found them to be utterly baseless, struggling to believe the story. However, he sentenced the accused to five years of rigorous imprisonment. It was later found out that the so-called attacker was actually a Muslim leaguer. In order to aid the British in undermining Mashriki politically, Jinnah allowed the publicity of this fictitious incident, and it continues to be cited in various publications. Mashriki expressed regret that Jinnah, who ultimately lost the case, used this attack against him to undermine his political standing. This attack was not the sole instance of aggression against Mashriki during the freedom movement, as he faced several other serious attacks. Nonetheless, Mashriki managed to survive each time. This phony assault did not deter Mashriki from his course. To Mashriki, it was clear that the British would never grant independence to the Indian subcontinent as long as the Muslims and Hindus did not come to a settlement. To exert pressure on both Jinnah and the British rulers, Mashriki ordered Kaksars to send mail to Jinnah and the Viceroy of India, demanding a Jinnah Gandhi meeting. As such, they sent over 200,000 telegrams, letters, and resolutions to Jinnah and the Viceroy of India, urging them to hold the Jinnah Gandhi meeting. Mashriki also encouraged Gandhi to meet Jinnah. The combined pressure had an impact, and Gandhi sent a telegram to Mashriki confirming his willingness to meet Jinnah. When Gandhi embarked on his train journey to Bombay, now known as Mumbai, in September 1944 to meet Jinnah, there was a legitimate concern that he might face harm from imperialist agents and that this meeting would be prevented. This concern stemmed from the possibility of jeopardizing Mashriki's endeavors of forming a unified front against British rule by allowing the meeting to take place. To mitigate this risk, a hundred Kaksars traveled in the same train as Gandhi. The presence of the Kaksars around the same compartment as Gandhi served as a precautionary and protective measure, ensuring Gandhi's safety and shielding him from any potential threats posed by imperialist agents during the journey. Upon their arrival, the Kaksar leader delivered Mashriki's message to Gandhi, wherein Mashriki had guaranteed India's immediate freedom if Gandhi could reach an agreement with Jinnah. Additionally, 
4,000 Koksars arrived in Bombay to create a conducive atmosphere for the Jinnah Gandhi meeting. The Koksar camp in Bombay was headed by Professor Dr. Rafiq Ahmed. In Mumbai, the Koksars engaged with Muslim, Hindu, and leaders of other faiths, sincerely working towards unanimity and garnering support to ensure the success of the Jinnah Gandhi meeting. Their efforts were widely appreciated, and leaders from various backgrounds praised the Koksar movement's endeavors and contributed in any way they could to influence the meeting's success. However, despite deliberations from September 9th to 27th in 1944, the Jinnah Gandhi meeting ultimately ended in failure. Mashriki was disappointed as his hopes to liberate his nation were once again dashed to the ground. However, Mashriki came to know from the Koksars in Mumbai and other sources that the meeting between Jinnah and Gandhi was merely for public consumption and that both leaders were insincere. It was revealed that they were directed to continue the British agenda, which aimed to perpetuate division between Muslims and Hindus through confrontational politics, fueling hatred between the two communities. This was further evident when both Jinnah and Gandhi did not accept Mashriki's The Constitution of Free India, 1946 AC, which protected the rights of all individuals of all faiths and was created after consulting 75 political parties to maintain the unity of India. The intentions of Jinnah and Gandhi to divide Muslims and Hindus also became apparent, especially considering that, as lawyers, they never produced a constitution to protect the rights of all communities and bring an end to the confrontation. It is also important to note that Gandhi was against private armies to overturn British rule via armed revolt. Therefore, even though Gandhi corresponded with Mashriki and met Koksars many times during the freedom movement, Remaining vigilant of their activities, he was actually opposed to the Koksar movement for various reasons. Furthermore, Gandhi was also against both Mashriki and Subhas Chandra Bose, also known as Nataji. Here it is important to provide a little background on Bose. He sought assistance from the Axis powers, particularly Germany and Japan, to lead the Indian National Army, also known as INA which was created out of Indians who had surrendered to the Japanese as soldiers of the Indian British Army. In his pursuit of India's independence, Japan in particular played a significant role in supporting the Indian National Army by providing military training, arms, and other resources. Japanese officials and military leaders saw the Indian National Army as a means to end British colonial rule in India. Bose took over the Indian National Army in June 1943. While there are no known instances of a face-to-face -face meeting between Mashriki and Bose, the Koksar circle suggests that Bose closely observed Mashriki's actions. For example, Mashriki did not think Gandhi's methods could ever bring freedom. Subsequently, Bose emulated Mashriki by embracing his tactics and employing military organization in the pursuit of liberating the Indian subcontinent. Bose also started wearing uniform and used the Indian National Army to free India. In the 1930s, Mashriki had inducted women into the Koksar movement and issued currency notes intended to be exchanged for regular currency after India achieved independence. Furthermore, in 1939, Mashriki formed a parallel organization. Taking inspiration from Mashriki and mirroring his approach, Bose also inducted women into the Indian National Army. In October 1943, Bose formed the Provisional Government of Free India, also known as Azad Hind in Singapore with the support of the Japanese. Bose also issued currency notes with the same intention, aiming to exchange them for regular currency once India gained independence. Like Koksar movement, Indian National Army was also comprised of Muslims and non-Muslims. Mashriki had expressed his belief in the intertwined nature of bloodshed and ruling throughout history, mentioned in October 1938. Blood and rule have always gone together in all history. Interestingly, years later, Bose echoed a similar sentiment, proclaiming, Give me blood, and I shall give you freedom. Notably, Mashriki advocated for Muslim-Hindu unity, and Bose also shared this belief. Both leaders recognized the importance of unity and worked towards a common goal of freeing India from colonial rule. While Mashriki and Bose shared a commitment to Indian independence and opposition to British rule, they had different approaches and ideologies when it came to the struggle for independence. Bose, at its peak with about 40,000 personnel, focused on armed resistance and forming alliance with Japanese during World War II, 
whereas Mashriki believed in the strength of his nation and formed an army of over five million Kaksars, who did not take any funds or favors from foreign sources. Mashriki even formed branches of his party in different countries, but never took foreign assistance in any form. In 1945, Subhas Chandra Bose witnessed the surrender of his Indian National Army to British forces. This event marked the end of Bose's role in the freedom struggle, regardless of whether he was alive or dead. Prior to the surrender, although Bose had been fighting from outside India, many viewed him as an Axis puppet due to his alliance with foreign powers, as no one provides help or offers a free lunch. It's worth noting that the documentary, considering its focus on Alama Mashriki, may not delve deeply into this perception. However, for this reason and others, the public looked up to Mashriki to achieve their freedom. For example, the Indian Express, dated June 18, 1944, reported that Lala Ram Ratan Gupta, a member of the Central Legislative Assembly, had written to Alama Mashriki requesting him to try to achieve Indian independence first before attempting to solve the problem of Hindu-Muslim unity. This was because Mashriki's army of millions of Kaksars, spread across the entire India including Burma, had been fighting from within India and without foreign help, which led the public to have high expectations of Alama Mashriki in achieving Indian independence. To the masses, foreign assistance would have meant replacing British masters with new foreign masters. Furthermore, the reason why the masses admired Mashriki was that he was boldly challenging the British rulers right under their noses, which was unprecedented. The masses had not witnessed such courage from leaders of any faith, be it Muslim, Hindu, or others. The key reason for this was that Mashriki possessed an incomparable and dominant street power that others lacked. Mashriki himself knew that the public was looking up to him and mentioned, The Kaksar movement is vitally necessary today because all other Indian movements have failed, their armies and soldiers have dispersed. Now we need a permanent standing army which may be unbreakable and really capable of meeting and solving every issue, and which may be able to withstand the enemy. The Kaksar soldier is ready to meet all eventualities and he is ready to protect his nation at any and every moment like the army of the government. In light of these realities, Major General Shah Nawaz Khan and two colonels from the Indian National Army paid a visit to the Kaksar headquarters in Lahore, where they had the opportunity to meet with Mashriki. During their meeting, they expressed their heartfelt gratitude to Mashriki for his instrumental role in securing their release. Moreover, the officers engaged in discussions pertaining to future strategies and sought Mashriki's invaluable guidance and insights. It is crucial to mention the visit of Major General Shah Nawaz Khan, along with two colonels from Bose's army, one Hindu and one Sikh, as well as the joining of Major General S.D. Khan and other soldiers from the Indian National Army. Not only the public, but also the soldiers looked up to Mashriki for freedom. However, it is important to note that while these events are historically significant, which are unknown to people in India and elsewhere, additional details surrounding this topic are beyond the scope of the current documentary. As a result, further discussion regarding these details cannot be undertaken within the context of this documentary. Nevertheless, in the 1940s, a significant number of Kaksars were in the Indian military forces, which was also mentioned by Dr. Sir Ziau Din, Vice-Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University in the Central Legislative Assembly on September 23, 1942. During his speech, the Vice-Chancellor stated that there were already 3,000 Kaksars serving in the Indian Army, and among them, 50 held officer positions. On Alama Mashriki's orders, these Kaksars waged an audacious campaign to incite a mutiny within the armed forces in British India. The Kaksars' determination knew no bounds, and their efforts yielded triumphant results. In February 1946, a mutiny erupted, unleashing a seismic wave of change. Not only did the mutineers reach out to Coxar headquarters for help, but they also boldly replaced the British flag with the resolute red flag of the Coxar movement. The Al Isla Journal reported that the naval strikers paraded through the streets of Bombay, proudly carrying the Coxar flags. Eventually, they even raised these very flags aboard their ships. This historic feat resonated with unyielding resolve. Undeterred by the risks, the Kaksars carried the torch of defiance, 
manifesting their actions in the wide dissemination of anti-British rule flyers and the strategic utilization of various methods to ignite a revolutionary fervor among the masses. Their actions sparked widespread protests. However, the government responded with ruthless brutality, plunging several lives into darkness. Among the fallen heroes was Abdus Salam, a valiant coxar whose tragic demise ignited a blazing inferno of public outrage, eroding the foundations of the imperious British Raj. The arrival of the cabinet mission in 1946 was a feeble attempt to counter the effects of the mutiny in India's armed forces and maintain its hold on British India. However, the cabinet mission, in its program, failed. When considering the trajectory of political negotiations from the Crips mission to the Simla conference, the Jinnah Gandhi meeting, and finally the cabinet mission, it becomes apparent that all these initiatives ultimately proved unsuccessful. Unfortunately, these activities aimed to instill hope among the masses of the Indian subcontinent for their long-awaited freedom, which seemed to remain elusive. With no end to British rule in sight, Mashriki moved to stage a coup and declared, After 16 years of unprecedented self-sacrifices, we are now ardent to achieve our objective as fast as possible and will do anything and everything to reach our goal. The Alama wrote, Every principle and every action of the Kaksar movement is based on military patterns. The Kaksar soldier is not a showy and toy soldier. He is a perfect military man. The Kaksar commander is not a nominal commander. He is a military commander. The line of Kaksars is not a row of toys glittering in gay attire. It is the line of undaunted, fearless soldiers. In November 1946, Preparations for the coup were finalized at a Kaksar camp in Peshawar. Mashriki delivered a revolutionary speech to 110,000 Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, and people from other faiths, including 10,000 uniformed Kaksars, shedding light on the futile politics of both Muslim and non-Muslim leaders and the British exploitation of India's resources. To implement his mission, Mashriki also established a Kaksar Reserve Bank to further the cause of independence for the Indian subcontinent. On December 1, 1946, Alama Mashriki made three proclamations. The first announcement urged Kaksars to prepare for a parade across India with spades, with each member expected to bring ten men and ten women. The second proclamation stated, Kaksar headquarters shall soon issue an order that in the entire India, four million Kaksars, side by side with hundreds of thousands, rather millions of supporters, shall march simultaneously. This moment shall dawn upon us very soon, and that is why it is being ordered that a grand preparation for this historical day should commence immediately, so that the British can clearly witness the day of India's freedom. The third proclamation invited, 10 million Muslims, Hindus, non-Muslims, Kaksars, retired Indian Army soldiers, as well as Subhas Chandra Bose's Indian National Army personnel, who had returned to India after surrender to join the forthcoming March for Freedom. In the meantime, from December 3rd to 6th, 1946, talks in London among Jinnah, Nehru, Lord Wavell, and the British rulers failed. As usual, nothing came out of the London talks. The ruler's next game plan, which was obvious from Mashriki's statement on December 5, 1946, was to encourage civil war between Muslims and Hindus to avert Mashriki's coup plan and continue their rule. To counter this, on December 5, 1946, Mashriki said, London talks may fail and civil war is being openly predicted. If not restricted or averted, it may prove not only the doom of India's freedom, but also India's doom. I, therefore, order every Kaksar in India to stand up alert from the moment this order reaches him and gird up his loins to stop this slaughter even at the cost of his life. I want every man, woman, and child, old or young, Hindu or Muslim or non-Muslim, to come forward and stop this wholesale slaughter by offering his life and force of his character. Muslim and Hindu Kaksars should march side by side with their belches and should proclaim that they have worked for 16 years together and stand as monuments of Hindu-Muslim unity. Alama Mashriki's daring and rebellious actions, such as delivering speeches, establishing a bank, and having Kaksars distribute anti-British rule materials, made it evident to the rulers that the days of British reign in India were numbered. 
According to a file from the British Home Department, government officials apprehended that if the Kaksars were victorious, English men, women, and children throughout India would be massacred. This event would be more disastrous than the Royal Indian Navy Mutiny in 1946, as it would signify a revolution of Muslims throughout India. In response, Prime Minister Attlee promptly announced on February 20, 1947, that power would be transferred no later than June 1948. However, Mashriki believed that this announcement was a ploy to counter his efforts and buy time to incite a civil war. He stated, The announcement is a signal for the start of a horrifying clash between Hindus and Muslims. I foresee the massacre of at least one million people in this trick of the British Prime Minister. In order to quash any further maneuvering and put the final nail in the British Raj's coffin, on March 1, 1947, Mashriki commanded a formidable force of 300,000 Kaksars to converge in Delhi on June 30, 1947. Their mission was to seize control of vital locations, such as government offices, the Viceroy's Lodge, media offices and radio stations, and boldly proclaim the end of British rule in India. The sheer magnitude of the Kaksar uprising and the massive assembly would have rendered the British utterly powerless. With simmering severe resentment against oppressive British rule coursing through the veins of the masses, including the armed forces, leaving them incapable of supporting the continuance of British rule, the stage was thus set for the impending triumph of independence. Lord Mountbatten arrived in India on March 22, 1947, aiming to transfer power by 1948. However, in Bihar on May 10, 1947, Mashriki declared that mass revolution alone and not the change of viceroyalty would bring independence to India. Addressing over 50,000 people in Patna on May 23, Mashriki called for a Hindu-Muslim revolution. He said, Peaceful transfer of power handed over to men who have been trained in British way of thinking will bring nothing but worse form of British Raj again. This Raj will be ten times more tyrannical, more deformed, more ghastly, more imperialistic and non-Indian than even the worst form of British Raj. It will, in fact, be a travesty of all truths and a parody of every good or bad thing that the British have given to India during the past 100 years. It will be, in fact, an anarchy in order, a stereotyped tyranny, and a confusion worst confounded. It will be a perpetual reign of atom bomb and rule of terror. It will be regalized genocide and state killings. It will justify murder of children in mothers' wombs, wholesale destruction of all cultures, suppression of all true history, murder of philosophy, total wiping out of honorable traditions, and wholesale slaughter of ideas. Handing over power to one or many political parties in India would mean a rule of worse imperialism, worse capitalism, worse halakuism than all the history has yet produced. It will, in fact, be British Raj without British traditions. It will be a reign of hell on earth. It will decimate the beautiful culture of Asia, the beautiful code of Asiatic moral laws, the beautiful philosophy of peace and tolerance, in fact, the beautiful fundamental truths that Asia has ever given to mankind during the last 5,000 years. The present plan of transfer of power, to my mind, is the diabolical plan of the relentless rule of Birla, Brahmin, and Khan Bahadur Raj, where arrogance, money, and tyranny will rule rather than human beings. The last remedy under the present circumstances is that one and all rise against this conspiracy as one man. Let there be a common Hindu-Muslim revolution in which not hundreds but millions will lose their lives by the bullets of Birla and the British. Millions will die, no doubt, in this way, but hundreds of millions will be saved forever. If man has decided to kill man for sheer lust of power and with nothing to show to the world except tyranny and loot, it is time that we should sacrifice men in millions now in order to uphold truth, honor, and justice. Meanwhile, Nationwide distributions of flyers and brochures by Kaksars continued. While the cinema slides were played in cinemas across the country as part of their efforts to prepare the nation for the overthrow of British rule. In a strategic move driven by a deep understanding of the potential threat posed by the assembly of 300,000 Kaksars on June 30, 1947, Lord Mountbatten expedited the partition plan by advancing the transfer of power to an earlier date. The original plan, announced by Prime Minister Attlee on February 20, 1947, 
stated that power would be transferred no later than June 1948. Realizing the urgency of the situation, Mountbatten swiftly convened meetings with Muslim, Hindu, and leaders of other faiths to communicate his accelerated partition plan. Through these discussions, which concluded on May 15, 1947, Mountbatten successfully garnered support for his vision. Without wasting a moment, Mountbatten swiftly departed for England, where he wasted no time in engaging with the highest-ranking British officials. Astonishingly, within a mere five days, the British cabinet approved the plan to divide a country as huge as British India. This extraordinary display of expeditious decision-making, addressing a matter of unprecedented complexity, stands as an indisputable testament to the harrowing fear that gripped the British rulers, apprehensive of their rule being overthrown by a Lama Mashriki using 300,000 Koksars. The cabinet's resolute approval to divide the intricate nation of British India is mind-boggling, considering the logistical challenges that typically accompany partitioning a single province, let alone such a vast country. Upon arrival in Delhi at around 11 p.m. on May 30, 1947, despite the fatigue from his journey, Mountbatten wasted no time in summoning Jinnah, Nehru, and other Muslim and non-Muslim leaders for a critical meeting on his partition plan. The meeting took place on June 2nd. According to a news item in the daily newspaper Amrita Bazar Patrika, dated June 1, 1947, Gandhi made the following statements on May 31st. Before prayers, Gandhi urged people to remain adamant against the establishment of Pakistan. After prayers, Gandhi emphasized that there should be no Pakistan through British intervention. Recognizing the pressing nature of the prevailing situation, Mountbatten urgently summoned Gandhi, even on the same day when Gandhi traditionally observed silence. Disregarding his day of silence, Gandhi hurried to meet Mountbatten. A daily newspaper, Amrita Bazar Patrika, dated June 3rd, reported that Gandhi left for the Viceroy's house in response to an urgent telephone call to meet Lord Mountbatten. According to the Coxar Circle, Mountbatten apprised Gandhi of the grave situation. If he did not accept the partition of India, Alama Mashriki would take over the reins of India, and India would be in the lap of Muslims again. Mountbatten also conveyed Jinnah was only given limited territory, a diminished Pakistan. Realizing the gravity of the situation and what his community was getting in comparison to Muslims, Gandhi immediately agreed to accept the Mountbatten plan. It should be noted that if Mashriki had gained control of the Indian subcontinent, it would have greatly benefited India. He could have united the nation and undone the divisions created by Jinnah and Gandhi's politics, fostering harmony. Furthermore, Mashriki had already issued the Constitution of Free India, 1946, which protected the rights of both Muslims and non-Muslims. With his extraordinary and outstanding abilities, he would have made India the most powerful nation in the world, a prospect that was not acceptable to the British and other pivotal powers. While these discussions with Muslim and non-Muslim leaders were ongoing, many parts of India were burning, and riots between Muslims and non-Muslims were taking place. According to the Kaksar Circle, the riots were fueled by both the Muslim League and the British for their vested agendas. Amrita Bazar Patrika, May 31, 1947, reported that Gandhi remarked, the British officials should know what the people were whispering. Many believe that they were fomenting riots. On June 16, 1947, the same newspaper revealed Nehru's assertion, Britain's hand behind riots. In the face of these heart-wrenching tragedies, the clamor for self-interest prevailed, overshadowing all other concerns. The ruthless priority for everyone became the acceptance of partition, ensuring the prevention of Mashriki's inevitable takeover. To ensure Jinnah's genuine acceptance of the partition of Punjab and Bengal and his unwavering commitment to the plan, Mountbatten went to great lengths. This included summoning Jinnah at an unconventional time, late at night on June 2nd. Jinnah visited the Viceroy at 11 p.m. and assured Mountbatten of his acceptance of the plan as reported by the dawn. The Muslim League president, Jinnah, called on the Viceroy. It is understood that the League president assured the Viceroy of his acceptance of the plan and that he would throw his weight in favor of getting the Muslim League Council to accept it. 
The swift approval of Mountbatten's partition plan by both Muslim and non-Muslim leaders in a two-hour meeting, without knowledge of border lines, distribution of assets, and other critical matters, with the Viceroy undeniably indicates the prevailing fear of Mashriki's potential ascendance to power. Following the midnight Jinnah-Mountbatten meeting, the Mountbatten plan was announced on June 3rd. On the same date, Attlee announced in the House of Commons that Britain would leave India earlier. Then the Viceroy instructed his secretariat to speed up the division work. Simultaneously, Britain to hand over authority by August 15, 1947 was announced. Provinces were directed to give their verdict within June. As soon as the partition was approved, a feeling of profound relief was felt in London. Meanwhile, Jinnah called an emergency meeting of the All India Muslim League, which took place on June 9, 1947, at the Imperial Hotel in Delhi. Jinnah did not allow criticism and asked the members of the Muslim League to approve the partition plan, which they did. In the meantime, before the Muslim League approved the plan, extensive measures were taken to prevent Mashriki from impeding the partition. To ensure the smooth acceptance of the partition plan without obstruction, Section 144 was already in place, which prohibited gatherings of more than five people in a given place. Its purpose was to prevent the assembly of Kaksars. Moreover, Delhi was meticulously searched for Mashriki and the Kaksars. Not only that, the Canberra Times, June 11, 1947, reported that on June 9th, the day the Muslim League held its meeting to accept the partition plan, Alama Mashriki was stabbed. According to another newspaper the next day, Mashriki was arrested. With these measures, anyone can understand the power of Mashriki and why these actions were taken. A few days later, in another urgent meeting on June 14th, the Indian National Congress also gave approval to the partition plan. Considering everything was rushed and major approvals had to be completed within June, have you ever considered that the panicky situation was none other than the Coxar Assembly on June 30, 1947, and the toppling of British rule by Mashriki? While you may have believed that all significant revelations had been unveiled in this documentary, be prepared for several more remarkable discoveries yet to be revealed. Both Jinnah and Gandhi underwent shifts in their positions, contradicting their previous stances. To delve further, let's first examine Jinnah's backtrack from his initial principled stand. In June 1947, Jinnah accepted the partition of Punjab and Bengal provinces, despite his earlier staunch opposition, which is as follows. On February 23, 1947, he emphatically declared, The Muslim League will not yield an inch in their demand for Pakistan. Later, on May 1st of the same year, he denounced the partition calling it a sinister move actuated by spite and bitterness. He further said, I do hope that neither the Viceroy nor His Majesty's government will fall into this trap and commit a grave error. Merely three weeks later, on May 21st, Jinnah demanded a corridor between East and West Pakistan, expressing his resistance by stating, Partition of the Punjab and Bengal, if affected, will no doubt weaken Pakistan to a certain extent. Weak Pakistan and a strong Hindustan will be a temptation for the strong Hindustan to try to dictate. I have always said that Pakistan must be a viable Pakistan and sufficiently strong as a balance vis-à-vis -vis Hindustan. I am therefore deadly against the partition of Bengal and the Punjab, and we shall fight every inch against it. When Jinnah accepted a truncated Pakistan, strong opposition arose within his Muslim League. Among the opponents were Professor Abdur Rahim, a member of the All India Muslim League Council, and Zahirul Hassan Lari, deputy leader of the United Provinces Muslim League. Moreover, Muslims from Bengal, who had specially come from Calcutta, gathered outside the Imperial Hotel where the Council of the All India Muslim League session was being held, shouting, Down with the division of Bengal! In addition to the Bengali protesters, there were others denouncing the partition of Punjab and Bengal. The idea of demanding territories like the Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh, Baluchistan, and Bengal to establish Pakistan, despite Muslims already holding power in those regions, raises questions and lacks logical reasoning. Additionally, creating a country with two wings, separated by over a thousand miles, can be seen as irrational. Accepting the partition of the two provinces, Punjab and Bengal, 
resulted in a reduction in the geographical areas allocated to Pakistan. However, if India had not been divided, Muslims would have continued to rule a larger region. The partition of Punjab and Bengal not only confirms that Jinnah followed what the Mountbatten told him to do, but also highlights his lack of power to prevent the partition of the two provinces. The only thing Jinnah could do was to deplore the division. It is important to note that there was severe opposition across the board to the acceptance of the partition plan, except for the All India Muslim League. Out of hundreds, not a single political or non-political party, group, or entity supported partition. Based on the anticipation of dangerous consequences, partition was opposed throughout India and even abroad by Indian Muslims and non-Muslims alike. There were fervent hopes for the reunion of India in the future. Now let's examine some clips that vividly depict the widespread opposition to the division of India. Alama Mashriki was at the forefront of the opposition against the partition of India. On June 9, 1947, as the Kaksars arrived at the Imperial Hotel where the Muslim League was holding its session to approve the Mountbatten plan, they carried with them Mashriki's poignant message. It strongly emphasized the imperative of preserving Muslim unity, safeguarding their homeland, and upholding the cherished heritage that both Muslims and non-Muslims shared including historic buildings, religious sites, or monuments. Mashriki's message sternly warned against the perilous consequences of dividing British India, underscoring the potential devastation for the fate of its 400 million inhabitants. According to Mashriki, such division would only serve to intensify violence, affecting the lives of both Muslim and non-Muslim individuals. This ominous outcome would establish two antagonistic nations and ultimately destabilize peace within the region, all while catering to the interests of influential powers at play. However, it can be easily understood that Jinnah, despite having a vested political agenda, should have been aware, making it hard to believe that he was unaware, of the British using him as a means to divide and permanently weaken India. Nevertheless, he chose to prioritize his own objectives and persisted in disregarding the concerns voiced by others. To avoid any obstruction to his plan, he issued instructions to the All India Muslim League National Guards not to allow the Kaksars, who were unhappy with Jinnah for accepting partition and a truncated Pakistan, entry into the Imperial Hotel. Therefore, as soon as the Kaksars arrived, armed Muslim League guards and the police posted at the hotel premises attacked them. Police fired tear gas grenades and charged at the Kaksars with bayonets. The attacks by the police and Muslim League guards resulted in the hotel lobby being spattered with Kaksar's blood. Several Kaksars were arrested. However, the pro-British domestic and international media wrongly reported the incident, for example, claiming that the Kaksars had come to kill Jinnah. The newspapers, instead of portraying their genuine concern, carried headlines that gave a negative impression of the Kaksars. Examples of such headlines included Jinnah Saved from Assassins, Fanatics Attempt Life of Muslim Leader, Hunt for Leader of Muslim Rebels, Kaksar's Hooliganism, and Kaksar's Invade League Council Meeting. As a routine, the media consistently came up with such headlines to put the Kaksar movement in a bad spot. 
The media did not report the true intent behind the Coxar's visit to the Imperial Hotel, and they ignored the fact that the Coxar movement did not believe in violence. The matter of fact is that Jinnah, being an ambitious politician, assisted the British in dividing India so that he could become the founder and governor general of Pakistan. Consequently, he was willing to go to great lengths to support the British rulers. To accomplish his objective, Jinnah spared no effort, including suppressing Mashriki. As an example, he granted his followers complete freedom in their actions, leading to a life-threatening attack on Mashriki. Additionally, they engaged in disruptive activities, such as the disruption of Mashriki's public meetings. Jinnah neither halted nor condemned these attacks. On the other hand, throughout his political career, Gandhi consistently emphasized the importance of a united India. On March 31, 1947, he declared, If the Congress wishes to accept partition, it will be over my dead body. So long as I am alive, I will never agree to the partition of India. Nor will I, if I can help it, allow Congress to accept it. In April, Gandhi lamented, It hurts me to talk about the partition of the country. What will be the plight of a body if it is dismembered? And on May 7th, he expressed, I for one cannot agree to Pakistan on any account. I cannot tolerate any proposal for vivisecting the country. Even on May 13th, 1947, Gandhi stated, It is a partition by the British which has to be prevented at any cost. However, Gandhi became the first Hindu leader to accept partition. Amrita Bazar Patrika, dated June 6, 1947, wrote what Gandhi stated a day earlier. Gandhi told his prayer meeting tonight that he would not fast unto death to prevent the division of India unless his inner voice so dictated. The said paper quoted Gandhi saying, If the Congress commits an act of madness, does it mean that I should die? Then on June 4, at a prayer meeting, Gandhi stated, you know that I am coming straight after meeting the Viceroy. You should not feel sorry at heart that India is to be divided into two. Reversing from his original position, on June 14, 1947, Gandhi pleaded the case of partition in front of the All India Congress Committee, asking them to accept division, which they did. As a result of Gandhi's sudden turnaround from his stance of undivided India, leaders who were previously staunch supporters of Gandhi felt shocked disappointed and displeased. Nationalist Muslims and non-Muslim masses viewed it as treachery and betrayal of their trust in Gandhi, and thus they abhorred him. Gandhi suggested, do not resent the decision. Meanwhile, the Kaksars had been engaging with Gandhi, serving as intermediaries to convey the messages of Mashriki. Throughout 1947, they had at least three meetings with Gandhi, which took place on March 7th, May 24th, and July 1st. In each of these gatherings, the Kaksars delivered Mashriki's messages, assuring him of his plan to overturn British rule, which was within Mashriki's reach and only a matter of days, and assuring Gandhi of the importance of maintaining India's unity. To hide the truth, details of such meetings were never made public. Interestingly, just four days after the Kaksars delegation's meeting on July 1, 1947, a significant event took place. On July 5th, Edwina Mountbatten, the viceroy's wife, paid a visit to Gandhi at the Bangi Colony, a locality known for its residents who work as scavengers and sanitation workers. The reason behind Edwina's visit to Gandhi at the Bangi Colony becomes clearer when we delve into the context provided by the Kaksar Circle. Despite stringent restrictions on the entry of Kaksars into Delhi, as per Mashriki's directive from March 1, 1947, by that time, according to Kaksar Circle, over a hundred thousand Kaksars had already gathered in Delhi. This large assembly of Kaksars raised concerns for the Viceroy. Under this worry, Lady Mountbatten's primary objective was to personally obtain information from Gandhi regarding the discussions between the Kaksars and Gandhi himself. The main worry was that after receiving Mashriki's message, Gandhi still favored the partition or switched to his previous stance of keeping India united. These circumstances shed light on the urgency surrounding Edwina's visit to the Bangi colony, a place where dignitaries would typically not venture to go. Also, there is no record seen where any of the viceroy's wives ever visited Gandhi or any Indian political leader's place of residence. Mashriki's messages to Gandhi revealed a sincere dedication to a united India, promoting the harmonious coexistence of Muslims and Hindus.
However, when it came to the encounters between Coxars and Gandhi, certain complexities emerged in Gandhi's approach. According to Coxars, Gandhi had a knack for navigating challenging situations, occasionally using ambiguous language to advance his interests. While expressing admiration for Alama Mashriki's positions to the Coxars, Gandhi also engaged in discreet communication with the British authorities. This raises questions about the alignment of Gandhi's actions with his public proclamations, prompting consideration of instances where his objectives may have leaned towards British interests rather than solely India's struggle for independence. As previously stated, Jinnah ignored the anti-partition sentiments of Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and others. Similarly, Gandhi demonstrated a similar disregard by completely disregarding the fact that the majority, naturally, never desired the division of their homeland. Both Jinnah and Gandhi exhibited a lack of concern before accepting the partition, despite the understanding that it would inevitably escalate the ongoing riots into even greater violence. Shockingly, they both neglected the protection of human lives and properties, as well as the prevention of anticipated atrocities such as rapes and abductions. Knowing that Jinnah, Gandhi, and others played into the hands of the rulers, Mashriki came from far Bengal to Delhi in June 1947 to save the partition of India. This is evident from Mashriki's statement released to the press. Referring to Mashriki, the newspaper wrote that he had come from Bihar to put every obstacle in the way of Mr. Jinnah and his associates to prevent partition. Mashriki deplored the fact that the British themselves have decided the fate of Muslims through Jinnah, and that Congress has also forsaken its lifelong ideal of Hindu-Muslim unity by accepting the divided India. Mashriki made the right decision, which was to not allow the partition of India as it betrayed the country's cause and was gravely detrimental to the greater good of the people, as highlighted by the Free Press Journal's headline, Nation's Leaders Betray Country's Cause. However, Mashriki could not prevent the acceptance of the Mountbatten Plan, as already explained. Although the partition plan had already been approved, there was fear that Mashriki might still not accept it. Therefore, the Indian Independence Act was quickly prepared passed by the British Parliament on July 5, 1947, and received royal assent or approval on July 18, 1947. This act solidified the partition of India and set the stage for the birth of two separate nations, India and Pakistan. In August, two dominions, Pakistan and India, emerged within the Commonwealth realm. A ceremony took place on August 14, 1947 in Karachi, Pakistan, attended by Jinnah and Mountbatten, marking the birth of Pakistan. Lord Mountbatten, the final viceroy of British India, was present at the event in Karachi, where Jinnah, officially recognized as Pakistan's founder, was appointed as the country's first governor general. On August 15, 1947, Jinnah took the oath of loyalty, allegiance, and commitment to serve and support the English monarch. I will be faithful to his majesty or her majesty, his heirs and successors in the office of the governor general of Pakistan. On the same day, August 15th, a ceremony commemorated India's independence. Nehru, who became India's inaugural prime minister, and Mountbatten, serving as the governor general of India, attended this occasion. Although these nations achieved independence, they technically remained under the sovereignty of the British monarch. Jinnah, Gandhi, and Nehru, who endorsed India's partition, were rewarded. Jinnah was acknowledged as the founder of Pakistan and appointed its first governor-general, while Nehru was declared India's first prime minister. Gandhi was revered as the champion of India's freedom. Now, shifting to another perspective, it is worth considering the viewpoint of the Kaksar Circle, who not only actively participated in the freedom movement, but also observed the fear among British officials regarding the Kaksar Assembly. To them, no government could take such a large assembly lightly, given the determined and resolute character of the Kaksars. They firmly believed that the transfer of power would not have occurred without Alama Mashriki's order of 300,000 Kaksars, and they credit him for the fall of British rule in the Indian subcontinent.
Within the confines of the ground realities, evidence presented, and the events elucidated in this documentary, it falls within the scope of the viewer's prerogative to determine whether the transfer of power in India was a voluntary act or a direct consequence of Mashriki's looming power threat. Whether someone agrees or disagrees, as we believe in freedom of speech, everyone is entitled to hold on to his I her opinion. It is noteworthy that Mashriki perceived Atlee's announcement pertaining to the transfer of power as nothing more than a ploy to buy time, exacerbate the communal riots between Muslims and Hindus, and subsequently exploit the ongoing unrest as a pretext to deny India its rightful independence. This perception is evident in Mashriki's various statements, one of which was emphatically declared in May 1947, where he asserted, The British are bent on creating a rejuvenated imperial government out of the chaos of communal anarchy that they have so clearly engineered. Mashriki's convictions and actions posed a serious threat to British rule, as he sought to challenge their authority and establish an independent India. The swift acceptance of the partition of India and subsequent measures taken can be viewed as preemptive actions aimed at thwarting Mashriki's bid for power, thereby endangering British rule and the political careers of individuals such as Jinnah, Gandhi, Nehru, and others. Regrettably, both Jinnah and Gandhi failed to seize the opportunity provided by Mashriki to ignite a surge of national pride and overthrow the British rule. Had they embraced this opportunity with unwavering determination, the people of the Indian subcontinent would have stood tall, their heads held high in unyielding pride, garnering respect from all corners of the globe. Although Jinnah and Gandhi are widely revered as the champions of independence for Pakistan and India, respectively, the provided facts make a compelling case for Allama Mashriki to be considered the true champion of freedom for the Indian subcontinent, and deserving the title of the father of both Pakistan and India. Regrettably, certain factors have prevented Pakistan and India from acknowledging his significant role. Pakistan refrains from giving credit to Mashriki due to his opposition to the partition and not demanding the creation of a separate country for Muslims, which led the nation to attribute its founding to Jinnah. On the other hand, India officially declared Gandhi as the father of the nation, contributing to the reluctance to credit a Muslim, especially a Pakistani. Furthermore, the British establishment holds lingering resentment against Mashriki for his refusal to collaborate with the British rulers, which ultimately contributed to the fall of their rule. The factors mentioned have potentially added to the reluctance to recognize his true contributions. Some individuals weakly argue that the British departed India primarily due to their losses in World War II and their desire to evade responsibility for the riots. However, they overlooked the significant economic value that the Indian subcontinent held for Britain's post-war recovery. Furthermore, the appointment of Mountbatten as Governor-General and the presence of British officers in influential positions within the civil administration and armed forces of both India and Pakistan contradict these assertions. Ultimately, the decision to acknowledge Allama Mashriki's place in the struggle for independence lies with the viewers. It calls upon us to transcend barriers of partition, nationality, and religion, and to impartially assess the contributions of all those who played a part during the freedom movement. The truth is that the division of India was a calculated move of the British rulers. It was designed to weaken a united India and create two antagonistic nations, serving the political, economic, and other interests of Britain and external powers. This intent becomes evident from a statement made by General Sir Frank Walter Misurvi, the first commander-in-chief of the Pakistan Army, in August 1947. We have a real and honorable military task to fulfill in holding the gate of the continent, which contains the territories of Pakistan and India. This constant task means that we must be trained, equipped, and always ready for wars. Thus, the doors were opened for the sale of arms and technology to both countries. The partition of India escalated into a cataclysmic inferno of communal violence, tearing apart the very essence of humanity. The merciless slaughter claimed up to two million lives of Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, and people of other faiths, leaving streets filled with rivers of blood. Amidst this tragedy, rape, Sexual assault and abductions became horrifying realities, leaving indelible wounds on the conscience of society.
Their cries reverberated as their dignity was violated, leaving lasting scars on their lives. Children of all ages suffered. Many lost their parents. The deceased were burned, buried in mass graves or left exposed, torn apart by vultures. Mass migration from Pakistan to India and vice versa, involving 14 million individuals, became the largest in human history. In overcrowded refugee camps, filth was rampant, and both adults and children endured inadequate food and medical care. It is crucial to acknowledge that the majority of those affected did not willingly sacrifice for the creation of Pakistan or India, but were victims of the self-centered politics of a few leaders. As violence continued to ravage the streets of India, the Kaksars, risking their own lives, plunged into action to prevent murder, looting, rape, and abduction. Fearlessly, they opened their homes, becoming beacons of hope in the darkest of times. Regardless of religious backgrounds, victims and their loved ones admired the Kaksars for their unwavering commitment to humanity. Meanwhile, amidst the madness, the Kaksars rushed to Mashriki's house and offered to form a protective ring of at least 5,000 Kaksars around his residence, ready to protect him and his family. However, displaying unparalleled humility and an intense sense of duty, Mashriki declined their offer. Instead, he implored them to extend their guardianship to all, regardless of religious affiliation. Mashriki's words in his journal echoed with resolute determination, transcending religious, ethnic, and sectarian boundaries. I order all Kaksars and sympathetic individuals to set aside their work for at least two weeks and focus on preventing Hindu-Muslim riots. Mashriki's house became a sanctuary for countless victims seeking refuge. These survivors shared harrowing and deeply disturbing stories, some of which were profoundly embarrassing, adding another layer of complexity to their narrative. The Kaksars valiantly prevented the countless killings, rapes, and abductions of both Muslim and non-Muslim men and women. Now let's delve into additional information that provides a glimpse into the tragic incidents that happened during the partition. The magnitude of these horrors defies adequate description, and to spare viewers distress, Graphic images have not been included in this documentary. Having witnessed the chilling newspaper clips and tear-jerking, moving photographs portraying unimaginable violence and tragedies in this documentary, it is crucial to grasp the gravity of Mashriki's situation. The Indian subcontinent had never witnessed such brutality in its history. This ruthlessness and violence were a direct consequence of the confrontational politics between Jinnah and Gandhi, as well as the decision to partition India. Therefore, it is essential for people to understand why Alama Mashriki opposed the partition of India and why he ordered the rally of 300,000 Kaksars to reach Delhi on the 30th of June, 1947. By that date, well over 100,000 Kaksars had assembled in Delhi, which the Kaksars circle confirmed, though the pro-government media reported 70 to 80,000. In the presence of such a huge number of Kaksars, 
If Mashriki had refused to accept the partition, the start of a civil war between pro- and anti-partition factions would have been imminent, further fueling the ongoing massacres. But driven by his deep humanistic values, Mashriki could not bear to be callous, indifferent, egotistic, or self-centered. Despite the immense difficulty, he made the heart-wrenching decision to disband the Kaksar movement. His sentiments are evident in this heartfelt statement where he mourned the division of India in his words. Ah, after 17 years of relentless and sincere struggle, in which I dedicated the best years of my life and resources, the nation has failed to develop the qualities necessary to reclaim its authority in India. Furthermore, Mashriki's message read in Delhi on July 4, 1947, in front of hundreds of thousands of masses comprised of Kaksars and the public, resounded with a somber tone. A portion of it goes as follows. Now, with the establishment of Pakistan, a gift bestowed upon Muslims by the British, the last hope for the ten crore Muslims divided into various regions to continue their struggle for freedom has been lost. Thus, I hereby disband the movement. It is crucial to acknowledge that Mashriki, in his remarkable humility, never sought personal acclaim for his leading role in bringing an end to British rule. Given the relations between Muslims and Hindus, conditions in Pakistan and India, and the relations between the two countries, Mashriki's accurate predictions and insightful public speeches regarding the consequences of partition, his words of wisdom have stood the test of time. When the valiant men and resilient women Kaksars, including the public young and old, heard Mashriki's categorical and decisive message, they were engulfed by an overwhelming tide of grief. They chanted slogans such as Alama Mashriki Zindabad, Long Live Alama Mashriki, and Kaksar Tariq Zindabad, Long Live Kaksar Movement. Their hearts shattered into countless fragments and tears cascaded down their cheeks like a ceaseless torrent. Men and women Kaksars were not willing to leave Delhi. Distraught and anguished, they beseeched Mashriki with fervent pleas, imploring him to retract his decision. Their voices trembled with raw emotion, echoing through the chambers of their souls as they yearned for a glimmer of hope amidst the tempest of despair. But Mashriki could not revert his decision in the light of further bloodshed. Let us seize this moment as an opportunity for deep introspection, where we acknowledge the magnitude of the opportunity that eluded our grasp. Mashriki's legacy should forever serve as a guiding light, reminding us that the path to greatness is paved with sacrifice, perseverance, and an unwavering belief in the power of unity. He was a humble leader who never sought personal glory, but dedicated his life to the betterment of our people. It should be duly noted that an assemblage surpassing a hundred thousand was no trifling count, considering the stringent measures enacted by the government to thwart such a gathering. The authorities, for instance, positioned police pickets at every entry point to Delhi, effectively prohibiting the admission of the Kaksars. Vigilant law enforcement agencies in uniform and plain clothes patrolled the entire city, meticulously scrutinizing buses, trains, and all other modes of transportation, leaving no stone unturned in their quest to locate Kaksars. Even horse-drawn carriages known as Tongas were subjected to thorough searches. Section 144, a regulatory provision disallowing the congregation of more than five individuals in any given location, was enforced. The Kaksars resided in various places, including mosques like Fatapuri Masjid, and Shahi Masjid. The police conducted numerous raids, resulting in the apprehension of a substantial number of Kaksar members, including teenager Inayatullah Khan Asghar, one of Mashriki's sons. In numerous instances, law enforcement resorted to the use of firearms, thereby inflicting casualties and injuries upon a significant number of Kaksars. In jail, Kaksars were treated miserably. A lot of violence was inflicted on them. Mashriki's son was kept in solitary confinement. Upon release, Asgar was banned from entering India for ten years. The colossal Kaksar gathering was so significant and influential that it overshadowed and invalidated the narratives presented by the controlled media. It is also evident from the fact that the media discounted the number of Kaksar gathered. The media reported a figure between 70,000 to 80,000, whereas the true number was much larger. The event had a profound impact, 
causing fear among those in positions of power and creating unease within government circles. Despite the potential importance of reporting on this event, such coverage was prohibited due to the concern that it could alter the overall mood of the nation. On August 27, 1963, Alama Mashriki, a prominent freedom fighter, mathematician, and Islamic scholar, passed away at Mayo Hospital in Lahore. His death had a profound impact on South Asia's history, evoking widespread grief and mourning. Condolences poured in from around the world, including high-ranking Pakistani military and civil officials such as the former Governor General of Pakistan, the President of Pakistan, the Governors of East and West Pakistan, Federal and Provincial Cabinet Ministers, senior military brass, civil bureaucrats, and leading politicians. Apart from Kaksars, people from all over the country flocked to Lahore to attend his funeral, holding Kaksar flags and photos of Mashriki. The Kaksars organized a ceremonial burial, with Mashriki's body wrapped in a Kaksar movement flag and placed on a vehicle adorned with floral wreaths. Among the individuals on the funeral wagon, Mashriki's grandson, author Nasim Yusuf, a teenager then, can be seen on the right side of the circle in the image displayed on the screen. Roads were crowded with people paying their last respects, and touching scenes of sorrow and bereavement unfolded. There were hysterical scenes of crying, wailing, sobbing, and several men and women falling unconscious. Some expressed their pain through loud cries and lamentations, while others quietly shed tears. Many held each other for comfort. It was an extraordinary occurrence that almost all shopping centers and many offices in Pakistan remained closed to mourn his death. Mashriki's funeral prayers were held at the Badshahi Mosque, but the sheer number of attendees exceeded the mosque's capacity, leading many to participate outside the premises. This overwhelming turnout demonstrated the profound impact he had on his followers and supporters. Mashriki's funeral became one of the largest in history, estimated by different sources to have attracted between 100,000 to over a million mourners. Mashriki was laid to rest at the Kaksar headquarters in Itra, Lahore, where the movement had originated in 1930. The Kaksars paid tribute with a 101-gun salute, and the place echoed with thunderous sound. Kaksars raised passionate slogans, declaring that the beloved leader was dead but emphasizing that in his memory, the movement was alive and would always remain so. As his body was reverently lowered into its final resting place, the air was filled with a poignant mix of tears, cries, and mournful moans. The loss of this extraordinary and legendary soul was an immense blow, both for the nation and Mashriki's family, filling their hearts with profound grief, knowing they would never experience the warmth of his presence.